Kia ora, good morning everybody. We'll uh, reconvene the hearing on day two, continuing with the applicant and the applicant's evidence. <coughs> um, Mr Marson, I'll hand back to you. All right, thank you. Um, before we ask the heritage experts who are scheduled to come in, just one brief housekeeping matter. To do that, could, you, um, could I ask you please just to get a couple of copies of the application that are beside you, Madam Administrator? Um, and it arises out of a question about maps that would be um, zoning maps and things that uh, would be attached. So I just wanted to orientate you before you get to Mr Lyle on that. Um, so uh, in the blue folder under the first tab, which should be blue, at page five, is a table, and it's divided into sections A, B, and C. Yes. And section B describes the structure plan and planning maps and that would right. alter. And so there is the structure plan, the zoning maps, the overlay maps, and the district road hierarchy. And the notified version of those plans is behind the yellow tab. And these are correctly referenced at the bottom by reference to Schedule X, so they have a proper notation. Um, in the graphics bundle, which is handout two, um, some of the current revised versions of those maps are present, but we'll give you a complete set. Um, so the structure plan, the landscape overlay plan, the vegetation overlay plan, and the proposed zone plan are examples of the iterations of those maps, uh, but a complete set uh, is still being completed by Ruff right. and Mill. Thank you for that. I, um, I think that was in response to my question where I said, gosh, you know, I might be showing up my ignorance. And um, I think the, the reason I asked the question, I knew there was zoning maps here, it was really in relation to that commercial, that suburban commercial zoning. Oh, I see. And I'd seen the, the, the mass plan, the revised structure plan with the indicative roads and, and the boundaries. And, and I kind of thought, I don't think I've seen a zoning map, but I clearly had, but I just hadn't related it. So oh, that's all good. So I thank you, man. Sure accept it will be a zoning map. Right. So let's get underway. Just before you do, so um, <clears throat> we've got um, Mr. Miller and Ms. Young this morning, and I think we'd ask that they, they, they appear together if it's possible. Yeah. Um, we've, we've since talked. Um, um, we don't actually need to hear from Ms. Young now. We, we think we're satisfied in terms of the archaeology, but we would like her there in case there are questions that we put to Mr Miller, which may end up with an archaeological moment. I'm not sure there will be. Um, so we're just like Ms Miller there, but we don't actually need her to present her evidence. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> so um, those two, I think, are coming in by Zoom. Yes. Zoom. Oh, right. well, I'll just explain it to her. <coughs> morning, Robin. Oh, good morning, Morena. Um, so Amanda has dropped out, so... And, and do we have Dr McEwen coming by Zoom as well, or...? Yeah. Welcome, Mr. Mr. Miller. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. We're just waiting for Ms. Young. I don't know whether you heard, and I'll talk. I'll wait for Ms. Young to come up, and I'll just explain in case she didn't hear what I was saying before. Um, I'm here. Um, I apologise. I seem to have dropped out, but I think Tony's reconnected me. We can hear you. Can't see you. Um, have you got your video I'm on? Hi. Uh, the host apparently stopped my video. 
I do apologise for this. Well, Miss Young, it's not, well, let's, we'll get underway. It's not critical. I was just saying before we came on that um, the, we, the panel's been discussing um, all of the evidence, but in terms of archaeology and heritage, and um, we're satisfied and don't have any questions for you in terms of, of archaeology, so we don't actually need you to present your evidence, but we'd still like to have you here in case when we ask Mr Miller any questions, which, which actually are more archaeological focus, which you might be better to, um, to answer the question. So you're, if you're happy to listen in, and we may put questions to you, but we don't actually need you to present your evidence. I do apologise. Oh. That's right. Did you hear what I, did you understand what I had said? Yes. Oh, good. All right. Yes, I did. Okay, I thank apologize. you. So, I apologise. I have muted that. No, that's all, that's all right. <laughs> um, so, look, let's get underway um, with Mr Miller. Right. So, um, Robin, um, is that all right thank, now? Yes. Yeah. Robin, we'll start off with you. Um, would you just like to make a brief opening statement um, and any new information, the things that you need to bring to the table, um, <laughs> and then the panel might ask questions of you and Dr McEwen and yeah. Amanda if necessary? Can I just check, is Dr McEwen here? Oh, Dr McEwen's online. I assume this is Dr McEwen. Welcome. No, that's Amanda. Oh, that's Amanda, sorry. Uh, that's I don't Amanda know. Young. Oh, Amanda, th welcome. Um, Ms Sweetman, is, is Dr McEwen here? Yes, if she's at the top of the waiting room, if you could admit her, oh, please. Oh, can you hear her in too, thank you. Are you there, Dr McEwen? Can you hear me, Dr McEwen? Not yet. It says connecting to audio, so... Right, still connecting, right. Oh, yes, connecting to audio. I think we need to exit that screen. We need Doc, we need Mr. Miller, but um, so Dr. McEwen's still connecting to audio. We speak to Mr. Miller here. We just need um, Dr. McEwen to be able to hear. Yes. Yep. So, Mr. Miller, can you hear me, Dr. McEwen? If she can, she can't communicate back. Oh, Dr. McEwen, are you there now? Is she on mute? Oh, yeah, can we unmute her? Ask to unmute, yes. Ms. Sweetman, do you have your phone number? Yes, Thank you. Yes. She's on twice. Yeah, she's now on twice, so we need to remove her once. Dr. McEwen, can you hear me now? So she is still muted somehow. She's unmuted on this system. Is it? Yeah, Miss Whitman, could you just give her a phone call and we'll just thank you. Yeah, it seems fine at this end, I think. From
So the message is Dr. McEwen can hear us. He's, all right. Um, and if we have any questions from her, we will either feed that back through you or, or, or come back um, later on. Um, right, we'll get underway. Uh, Mr. Miller. Right, good morning. And I'll just, um, I thought I might summarise uh, things very briefly. Um, and then I was listening in yesterday. Um, I understand the panel has been to have a look at the building. Um, I have got a short um, PowerPoint slides, which are the images from my original report. Um, and if it is of any um, use to the panel, I'll be pleased just to uh, flick through those quickly and just explain um, my analysis of the um, of the building. Um, and I, also, I was very, very interested yesterday by Mr. Harley's statement. Um, and I, I think that that's probably um, filled a lot of gaps in for me. And that's maybe something that I can also um, show you by presenting a few images, if that's right. Thank you. So um, we, we've, we've had some success with Heritage. Um, we've had the joint witness statement um, and we, we had some agreement there that there's no statutory protection uh, to the wool shed um, and that the recommendations that Samantha Young and I, myself had put forward were reasonable in the circumstances. Um, and then um, subsequent to that, uh, Dr. McEwen's prepared her own assessment um, and considers that a building should be a category B um, on the uh, district plan. Um, and as I think it's very clear from our evidence, the disagreement between us, I think, is over magnitude of that mm. significance and also um, the viability of the building for adaptive reuse. So if I can just try and share my screen with you. Just. So as I say, these are um, photographs, but they're all included in my original um, report. So this is the, um, the south elevation the, uh, what I believe is the oldest part of the building is the uh, gabled um, timber web broad clad section there. And then there is a, a later addition, what I call part B on the right hand side and a lean to on the left hand side. The north elevation of the building, we're looking at the uh, rear part of um, building A, which I've called building two. And again, the, the later um, addition to the building on the uh, left there, part B. And then there's a small concrete uh, block killing shed uh, there in the foreground, which is post 1969. Just a few from, um, from the east, uh, looking at Part B on the left, the gabled form, and then the um, northern end of um, part A. And then just looking as best I could from the other side, um, which is the, the western lean to, and then the uh, sheep dip in those bushes running down the side there somewhere. <clears throat> so, this is what I believe is the oldest part of the building. It's essentially three walls. So, we've got the the um, timber weatherboard uh, clad walls and the studs, which you see on the left hand side, right in the, the center of the picture, and a little bit on the right hand side behind that um, a little store there, which says Haschem on it. Um, I believe that the roof isn't original to this part of the building. It's just looking, I've pretty much turned round and now looking north. Um, this is the rear part of um, part A of the building. Um, this is what is now the uh, shearing area. Um, and, and just one of the things that just occurred to me sort of fairly recently, and particularly listening to 
Mr. Harley's uh, statement yesterday. It's one thing that confused me as to why there wasn't a lot more shearing uh, graffiti, which is a very common thing to find in old shearing sheds in, in this part of the building. And that's been something that's been in the back of my mind for quite a long time. This is uh, part B, um, looking back towards part A1. Um, to me, this is a, a lot of modern material um, in this part of the building. Um, but what is interesting is those old weatherboards there um, with uh, graffiti. A lot of it is uh, 1960s graffiti. You can see that. I don't know how well you can see this picture, but you can see 1966, 1968 to 9. Um, and I think there's a 1968 to 9 again there with John Bass. This is the outside of the uh, building. Uh, this is looking at that timber gable um, on the south side. Um, there is an, an old, what I call a, a three light mullioned window there, um, rusticated timber weatherboards. Another very similar window. Um, this is on the opposite side of that elevation. You can see the central door there in, in the middle, just off the right hand side of the picture. Um, and something that I, I picked up on when I prepared my project memo, I was, um, I was just a little surprised by the glass that's um, there, because that's a, a press pattern glass, 20th century press, pressed pattern glass. That's uh, the that's inside uh, part A1, uh, looking west, and you can see there's a uh, window there which has been overclad with weatherboards on the outside face. Um, that's looking up at the south uh, gable, um, a couple of what I would say 1920s, 1930s windows there with those triangulated top lights. Um, another close up of uh, graffiti there in the, in the building. Um, that's the sliding door in part B of the, the building in the south elevation. Again with graffiti, um, there's Rebecca Richardson. I think that says 1967. Um, Wayne Salmon there in the middle. Um, and then there's um, some of the, the pulley equipment, um, which is in uh, building part A2. So, that's just a, a very quick refresher um, for the panel. Um, and I'm very happy to uh, hand over to for questions if you'd um, like that. The one thing that I learned yesterday um, was from Mr. Healy, um, and that's filled in a big part of the jigsaw for me because as I put in my original report, this is a building which has been very heavily modified um, during the 20th century. Um, I had assumed, you know, like all buildings, they develop over different phases and you get different um, additions to them over a course of decades. Um, but then when Mr. Healy started um, talking um, about how he'd been in and raised um, or taken up all the the floors um, or the slatted floors to remove the uh, sheet manure and all the internal petitions had come out, then that started to answer that question, which I, I mentioned earlier had been my, my mind, why wasn't there much more shearing graffiti in there? Um, he says that he at the time carted in uh, trailer loads of um, demolition material, salvage material um, and other stuff which the farm managers in 1970 then, uh, I guess, updated and remodeled the uh, building to what they wanted it to be at that time. Um, and that has really answered, as I say, answered the question for me. Um, it makes it very clear that I think we're looking at a primarily 1970-ish um, building now. Thank you. Okay.
Harley rather than Mr. Healy? Uh, uh, yeah. uh, sorry, Mr. Harley. Yes, yeah. Mr. Mr. G. Harley. Do you have questions of Mr. Mr. Miller, good morning. <clears throat> um, my one question is perhaps just to reiterate in my mind what I understand you have the skills and um, to back, back up your recommendation. You're a licensed building practitioner and you have sufficient experience to provide a very sound judgment on whether the building is in fact saveable. Would that be... Uh, um, if I can just explain my, my qualifications, I came to New Zealand about 12 years ago. Um, in 1986, I completed a degree in something called urban estate management. Um, I'm a UK um, chartered building surveyor, um, and that's um, uh, building surveyors are very strong in the UK. We primarily deal with all aspects of buildings, but my specialism has always been um, looking at the condition of buildings. Um, I have a a very, very strong interest in traditional building materials, uh, traditional techniques. Um, when I came to New Zealand, I became a, a New Zealand registered building surveyor, um, and I sit on the, um, the executive committee of the New Zealand Institute of Building Surveyors, and again, I, I'm a specialist for them in heritage buildings. And you've had experience in actually um, repairing or um, yes. Remediation work on on old old buildings. Yes, I I, I have a um, I have a practice. Church. We have two offices. Uh, there's about ten of us in total. Um, my staff includes um, three architects, or, or two architects and one architectural designer. Um, we are involved in the repair of all sorts of heritage buildings from at the moment Dunedin Town Hall, uh, St Paul's Cathedral in Dunedin. Um, I've been involved in repair of small timber frame cottages around Arrowtown. Um, yeah, absolutely. It's my everything I do is to do with repair, um, conservation, um, and adaptive reuse of, of heritage buildings. Okay, thanks very much for that, Mr. Miller. Just a couple from me, and again, um, <clears throat> thank you for your evidence and for the for the photographs. Um, and you've, you've partially answered it, and I was going to ask you why there is the disagreement between the, professionally between you and Dr McEwen, and I think it, it does. You're, you're quite right. I think when I read the evidence, it's down to the scale and magnitude of, of what you both think the significance of this building is. seems to me Dr McEwen, um, from reading her material, tell me if this is right, she has a stronger view about sort of these, what are sort of associative values of sort of its history and the families who, who ran the farm, and, and you, you have looked at more at this in terms of the heritage value of the building, is that correct? Um, obviously there are a whole uh, range of values which can be applied to a building. We're talking about historical value, um, and that's, as I, I said in my evidence, um, association is part mm -hmm. of that. Um, I normally see a strong association where uh, perhaps you have somebody who was born in a house, lived all their life in a house, and is a famous person. Um, my, um, I've, I've looked as much as possible into the history of this site and this building, and it's very clear to me that whilst the Richardsons were the land owners, um, the, the land was tenanted, the run was tenanted for many years, um, right through to probably around the First World War, um, when the Richardson family took over again. And so to me, it's highly likely that these building or this building was originally constructed by a tenant. Um, and Amanda Young has drawn attention to um, Burford, who was one of the tenants of the, the time on the land. Um, so there are undoubtedly there's an association there with the Richardson family. Uh, Dr. Kuhn sees that primarily as Ralphine Richardson. Now, having looked at that building in some considerable detail, I see the reference to Rebecca uh, Richardson. Um, and again, I think Rebecca Richardson was the daughter of um, Dennis and Leslie Richardson, who lived at the house Edendale there in the 60s. 
Um, and so there's undoubtedly some association there. I don't actually see any sort of manifestation of the association with Ralphine Richardson in the building. Um, and so to, so to my mind, it's, it's that association is there, but it's quite a remote association. And then so from certainly what we've learned about the building in uh, last day or so, um, really what we see there is probably uh, 1970-ish iteration of the building. Um, there's still that Richardson named some of the graffiti that's there, but again, it just, it makes that association remote to, to, to me or, or less, um, um, so I'm going yeah. for, um, less, less tangible. Thank you for that. Just um, and, and again, I think your evidence is clear, and, and Dr. McEwen's is, is clear, and, it, and it's just there's a difference of view. Coming to the rule that Mr. Lyles recommended, which I'm assuming has been helped informed by you, which is it would be a controlled activity to demolish this building, and it's and it's to do with the salvage of the Shearer's graffiti, which you've shown us. Is, is that all that graffiti from the 60s and 70s? So it's not historic; yes. it's just of interest. Yes. Yeah. And the same with the sharing equipment. Yeah, I mean, there's there's various bits of sharing equipment there, uh, which again could um, could could be of interest. Right. So th thank you. That I just want to make clear. So thank you. I don't have any further questions of you, and I'm not sure I've got any of Dr. McCune. I might come back, but I missed. Um, Mr. Marson, can I put back to you the question that we raised yesterday, and and Miss Sweetman might have a have a view as well, because there is clearly a con the issues and contention between these two experts, but Dr McEwen and Ms Sweetman have said this, in their view, meets the, the scheduling criteria and should be scheduled, and we raised, Ms Tepany raised, you know, whether we had jurisdiction to schedule it. I don't think we do, but, um, but hence it would be useful to know what your view on that is, because if we prefer your witness, then you've offered a controlled activity. If we decided on the evidence of Dr McEwen that its status was, well, its value was more than what Mr Miller was saying, what is, what is the outcome? What, what could we do? And I think I posed yesterday, would it have to be a different activity status? The council presumably could come along and schedule it if it wanted to in a separate process. So what's the legal position? I don't think yeah. you can schedule it, um, but you might decide, um, given if you prefer Dr McEwen's view to increase the activity status, right. I think that would be a response that was within scope. Mm. Right. Okay. Um, but the applicant's case is that not only is the difference uh, between the experts because of the assessment of significance. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Miller has applied his building surveying experience mm -hmm. to say, does this building have a future? Um, and that comes to the question of what is inappropriate use of heritage. Okay. So even if you got to the position of accepting Dr. McEwen's evidence on the historical, you still have to assess the question uh, what is the outcome that is appropriate for this building in light of uh, that and its condition and all of those things? And I think Mr Miller sits uniquely in the group as a person with knowledge of building um, value in a sense, its capability of adaptive reuse. And hence you would note the questions that Mr Mark Brown was asking in, the, in that respect. Yes, I think, yeah. I think that that's the unique value that Mr mm -hmm. Miller brings to the evidence yeah. in addition to the historical analysis. Ms. Wood, can I just ask you, do you do, on the issue of scheduling, do you agree that we don't have jurisdiction? Chair, I'm clearly not a lawyer. No. So I can't provide... Well, any... let, let me ask you this question. Do you, th if, would it, to schedule something, would that require a change to the district plan? Yes, it would. It would require right. the addition to the schedule. Okay. I mean, I mean, I think that's a sufficient answer to me. Thank, that's helpful. Um, thank you. Uh, do you have any questions? Do you have any further questions? 
Do you have any questions of Dr McEwen? I think, doc, I mean, that, given that she can't respond to it, she might want to come back um, next, on Thursday. Um, Dr McEwen will be here in person on Thursday. And, put, um, and so she's heard, 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 heard the questions and um, we can put that view to her then. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Miller. Thank you. Very Thank much. you, Robin. All right. Thank well, that And we don't have any questions of Ms Young? No, we know that. Thank you, Ms Young, and also thank you, Dr McEwen. Thank you. Um, so now we're into transportation, um, and I uh, bring forward Gary Clark. And just confirming, Mr Jorgensen, is it? For the council? Great, thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> Could I, can oh. I just check? Um, so oh, I've got yes. Andrew James is watching online. Right, right. Um, but if you were going to sort of do a, a more of a um, impanelled question approach, okay. um, we'd probably need to bring him in on the Zoom link rather than just watching. But other than that, if you're not planning to do that, then um, we did you. discuss that. We decided not to. I think it's better that um, when you're presenting on Monday that we have Mr James, then and then we'll certainly presume we'll have the council. I'm not sure whether. Um, the applicant's witness will be, but I think we'll do it Thank in that you. order. <clears throat> Good morning. Morning. Um, I'll just do a quick summary of um, where I'm at at the moment. So, and I think, did they get, oh, okay. Um, PPC 28 proposal aligns well with both national and regional policy statements and outcomes. The location of the development area in relation to the Nelson Central provides opportunities to encourage active transport modes and reduce vehicle use and travel. There are a number of key documents which includes the Regional Land Transport Plan, the National Policy Statement on Urban Development, Nelson's Draft Parking Strategy and currently out of consultation, Nelson's Active Travel, travel Strategy. The latter document, being the most recent, clearly articulates the future focus of transport outcomes for Nelson City. In summary, this document picks up on government policy direction to move to a less vehicle-centric transport system and encourage active and alternative transport modes. And it's just a short extract um, out of the, that strategy, which I'll just um, read. Active Nelson focuses on providing the framework and guidance to change the way we travel. It will deliver a programme of investment in walking and cycling over the next 10 to 15 years that will change the way we travel so it's more sustainable, reducing carbon emissions and private car use. The plan has been developed for all age groups and abilities to promote a broader well-being of all our community. The location of PPC 28, and particularly the Kaka Valley, provides the excellent opportunity for active and alternative transport modes due to its relatively flat route and being within five kilometres of Nelson City. The development area being located to the north and east of the city is able to use existing infrastructure, which is operating well below its functional capacity, especially when compared to the high levels of congestion and delays experienced on the southern side of Nelson. The use of the existing infrastructure with minor improvements again is in line with good transport outcomes. Through the process of assessing the site, preparing evidence, rebuttal statements and conferencing, refinements have been made to various transport measures which have further improved the plan change framework to provide more clarity on how the effects will be managed. These changes are generally accepted by the transportation experts. The key changes include improvements, to, improvements needed before occupation of any lots within PC28, which mostly relate to provisions for active transport modes and an intersection upgrade. There is also more robustness around preparation of transportation impact assessments for any proposed subdivisions which will ensure future impacts are considered at the appropriate time of con the consent process. At the high level, the framework of PPC28, and particularly Schedule X, provides mechanisms to address the existing network constraints and then other future impacts through the subdivision process. Through the rules and the LDM, there's sufficient control to provide an appropriate good design outcomes. And I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you very much. I'll start. Do you have questions of Ken Fortin? Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Clark. Um, my question relates to the, uh, the paths, walking and cycling paths, and in your, um, in your rebuttal evidence, the table in paragraph 58, which talks about the, the grades and the widths. So I understand that it's a steep site and 
you can't get, my understanding is that ideal cycling grade is probably one in 20, no more than one in 20. Certainly in Auckland that's what you'd be going for, but here it's different kettle of fish. So my first question is, are those grades and widths consistent with Osroads, Osroads or some other standard? The short answer to that question is yes. Um, yeah. And some of the uh, material provided by Mr Georgian has picked up on those um, grades. My second question is, you talk about e-bikes, and uh, from personal experience, I'm still on an old mountain bike, and, and I get a bit annoyed, or um, well not annoyed, but probably jealous when an e-bike goes past me. <laughs> but it, in terms of my question, are you happy that those widths are sufficiently wide, anticipating an increased use of e-bikes? In other words, because of the nature of the site, it's going to be pretty hard to say add on to the width later on and just, I guess, asking you as, as an engineer just that you're happy that, you know, that that's likely to be practical as far as you can see um, with assuming increased uptake of e-bikes. Yeah, there's, so there was a question yesterday, Mr Rate, about uh, cycle path widths and osroads. Osroads has a minimum of two metres and then it goes up to, well, obviously, as wide as you would like. The desirable sort of sits somewhere between 2.5 and 3.5, um, with, with the desirable being at 2.5. I think what you will find as part of the subdivision process and also Council's um, active strategy documentation is they may go for wider paths as part of that process. And one of the reasons behind that, for example, is the new mountain bike park, which opened, I think, last month which is going to generate more cycle traffic along that corridor anyway. Um, so I think you might find that the 2.5 is a minimum, but what might be built will be wider to cater for that demand. And you would be happy if 2.5 was actually in, ended up being adopted in terms of a, the, the, the issues that I've just talked about in terms of future increased, possible increased use of e-bike? Certainly as a minimum, yes. Can I just follow up on that a little? Um, do you know, in the Council's um, documentations and requirements, do they refer to the Aus, um, Austroads rules? Because that would actually provide a strong, um, because that, the Austroad requirements are quite specific in terms of the use of, of a path and what the minimum width should be. So for example, I think for commuter and recreation shared walking, cycling, I think they recommend a minimum of three metres. But, you know, is there sufficient um, within the council um, rules and guidelines to make sure that there is that um, So the LDM wider? does have a specific reference to Osroads, um, and, that, and that document, as you've said, has a number of different types of paths for different types of users. The key thing around that width is um, when you get more opposing traffic, if you like. That's where you need to stay for wider paths, um, and obviously when you get more um, use. But there is good guidance in the LDM which refers to the Osroads documentation. So you'd be confident that in the consenting process there would be um, sufficient width of, of paths put in for the use? Yeah, well, what I think you'll find as part of that <coughs> consenting process is there's the guidance in there in the LDM, and that, that from there that will follow to what type of path we're talking about and what type of use, and that will then dictate the width. Can we just put that same question to Mr Georgian, is that your understanding? We all need to have a training lesson <laughs> on how to turn the microphone on. <laughs> There we go. Um, Mr Clark is correct that the uh, LDM refers to the right. Austroads okay. standard, so there is that direct connection um, between the council standard being the land development manual and, right. and Austroads. Uh, where there is um, some control and guidance around um, path widths that does relate to grade, it does relate to um, expected numbers using the path as an example. Um, 
where paths um, have some steeper sections. Um, there's often a requirement for the path to be a bit wider because there's um, some variable speeds or greater variable speeds between uphill cyclists and downhill cyclists. So the idea of creating a bit of extra width in those steeper sections, that's just an example of um, some of the guidance that's in Austroads. Okay. Great, thank you, that's helpful. Do you have further questions? Okay. Very good. Um, a couple of broader questions, and there might, I might come a question back to um, Mr. Marson as well. Um, in terms of, I mean, you've been through expert conferencing, and I see Waka Kotahi have uh, essentially provided a letter of, of support for the proposal with one or two changes. But there are a num um, and, and about the sort of um, providing an alternative route to the state highway through, through this, but a number of submitters have raised concerns about um, traffic and transport you know, running through the whole site. Um, what's, what's, your, what's your view? What's the likelihood, do you think, of, of a large number of people using this alternative route in the State Highway? I mean, it may well be used in an emergency or if it was closed, but do you, as an expert, you know, looking at these issues, think there will be major traffic flowing through from the Bayview side through to the... Parker Valley side? In my view, no, but uh, there's a couple of caveats on there, of course. There's one, if there is some, an emergency situation where the State Highway is closed, then as um, Waka Katahi does with any road network, they will divert the traffic onto a, an alternative route until they've addressed that emergency situation. Um, I don't believe that Waka Katahi will ever um, use the road Bayview across the ridge and down as a alternative state highway um, should something happen um, more permanently on State Highway 6 because that's, it's just not designed for that type of use. Um, you may get the odd person that thinks it's more convenient coming from um, Blenheim to go up Bayview and across and down to access um, the Mai Tai. I, I don't think you'll get people wanting to access the city centre via that route because it's just longer and, and dare I say, more torturous because of the terrain they have to work through. Right. How much of an advantage do you see, and, and Mr George might, might answer as well, that resilience is built into the transport network if, if these roads are constructed? What, what sort of, how significant is that from a transport perspective? It's good practice. You, right. you should be providing resilience. Um, if, if something happened, um, for example, up ha halfway up Bayview Road and you couldn't get people out of that part of the residential area, that's a problem. And you've, you would have seen even just in the last week where resilience issues cause problems for people in terms of access to property and access to services right. with um, floods and trees and things. So it's important to have Mm -hmm. uh, resilience in terms of connections to other parts of the network. Right. Do you have the same view, Mr. Georgian? Does that count your position as a as a council expert? Uh, th th there is a you know, a sense of importance of having um, route resilience um, for emergency situations and so on um, as an alternative to the highway. Yeah, I wouldn't suggest that that means the um, uh, route needs to be designed to an equivalent arterial no, road I, standard I, or anything like that. Clear, I wasn't, it, I wasn't it, suggesting that either. I mean, it was, I was really kind of responding to a number of submitters who have raised concerns about this will become a major through road. And really, it's, I was really you know, about sort of network resilience and, and, and whether that of itself is, 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 a, is an asset. And I wasn't suggesting it would be. Yeah. And I so don't think you could, given the topography. Yeah. So, I, I, Yes, I, I see a purpose, you know, relating to those emergency resilience Entry. situations, um, but I don't see, you know, the route being used on a daily basis okay, as right. a um, convenient connection to the CBD, for right, example. Okay, well, you know, the, the, the highway route re remains as the obvious choice course, to yes. the city centre. Yes, there might be some occasional traffic as um, you know, Mr Clark identified from Blenheim heading to Mai Tai, but I don't see that um, compromising the, the function of that um, internal spine right. road. Thank you. 
As I read your rebuttal evidence and, and the joint witness statement, I don't think there, there's not too much disagreement between at least um, you and Mr George. Uh, is, is there anything still outstanding? Um, and I'm, and I'm really thinking about um, when the plan change was notified, there were no triggers or staging, and now it's recommended that there are certain upgrades that occur, intersections um, and these active modes prior to certain levels of development going through. I'm assuming these have all been discussed and negotiated between the parties. I know Mr James has a different view, and that's why we'll pick him up, pick him up next week. But it, um, what's been put into the, uh, what Mr Lyle has put into the draft provisions, does that accord with what you think is appropriate in terms of those upgrades? Mr. George, and I'll come back to you. Yeah, so the, there's, there's a, a front end requirement, okay. if you like, in terms of upgrades prior to any um, uh, um, housing being occupied within the site. Um, and then there's a um, yeah, provision for progressive reviews um, as the development occurs on the site through transportation assessments um, and the level of. Um, uh, response, need, mitigation required um, as development progresses across the site. Uh, the, uh, there is one area of um, difference that remains at the moment and that's around Bayview Road. Um, my view uh, remains that those provisions um, need to be tightened up um, a bit more than what is being proposed right. at the moment. Okay. Mr. Cl again, in terms of the um, those trigger um, upgrades, clearly, you are you, well. Are you satisfied that they are the appropriate upgrades that need to happen before certain levels of development? And the reason I'm asking the question is again, I'm just reflecting. We've got a large number of submissions who are saying that traffic and the increase in traffic, particularly you know, on the intersections, um, Ralphine Way, and further down the, the one lane bridge at Jekylls, um, and these. Um, active mode routes and Nile Road in particular and, and Nile Road is congested and a lot of these are said as I read are existing issues um, but are you satisfied that the provisions from a traffic engineering point of view that you have recommended or Mr Lyle now recommends satisfactorily address concerns about traffic and so I keep going on and that was the issue I was talking to Mr Marson about you know in terms of and I just reflect on that land code decision, and again, it's just mine because it was involved in some of the plan changes that we did in Auckland, where the courts have clearly determined it's not the role of this developer to provide all the solutions for any transport issue. So, hence, it's really the additional impact that this development might have on on the network was the reason I'm asking the question. So, we've been through um, quite a robust process through conference, which I think was extremely helpful to narrow down the issues. And where we've ended up with um, Schedule X is where I think we pick up um, those constraints in the network that need to be addressed before occupation, which um, are, are clearly articulated in the, in, in the schedule. Um, the, some of the, I do note that some of those issues are existing. And as part of preparing uh, a very lengthy document for Council as part of the long-term plan process, which you heard about yesterday, um, that identified some of those issues which were going to be included in the long-term plan, which were subsequently withdrawn in terms of funding. Um, in terms of the Bayview um, area of disagreement with Mr Jordan, I agree that there is um, some issues there. I think the, the subdivisions that are already occurring in Bayview are going to address those issues before Plan Change 28 okay, occurs. So I don't have a problem with the wording going in there, but I just think it's it's going to be addressed anyway. So it's just right. a belt and braces approach, if you like. The only thing I just want to explore a little bit, and again, um, it's in the beginning of your rebuttal, and it's this issue about um, vehicle emissions, which Mr James has covered. And I'll, I'll put some of the questions to Mr James. I mean, you clearly have a different view in, in the sense of, from a, a transport perspective, and the level of emissions, I think you accept that you know, all development will have some emissions and because of the location of this one it will have lesser than, than others. Do you just want to make any comments on that? Because again, we'll, I'll be asking Mr James his view on, on this. Yeah. Well firstly I'm not an emissions expert. No exactly. And that's, yeah. <laughs> um, but as part of my role in, in transport planning and traffic engineering we use um, 
computer models. Uh, one computer model, for example, is called SIDRA for assessing intersections. Um, as part of that package, they do have um, outputs that um, tell us um, CO2 emissions and things like that. So I do have some knowledge that if you increase delay um, and congestion, then you get an increase in emissions. So that's where my um, view comes from, if you like, from a transportation perspective. Um, the documentation used by Mr James has come from Nelson, sorry, Tasman District Council and talks about vehicle kilometres travelled, um, which has been used as a proxy to assess emissions. Um, and that's a fine proxy, but when you look at it um, from a congestion point of view, some of the comments around um, Stoke, um, Tahuna, and um, when you look at the emissions that come from there, compare it to um, the plan change area, there's a disconnect, if you like, because of the, the networks that those vehicles travel on. Mm -hmm. So the, what happens is census data provides you a uh, journey to work. It's a distance, but it doesn't assess um, congested networks. So there's, a, there's more emissions on the southern side of Nelson due to that congestion than there's on the northern side. Okay, right. Thank you. I have nothing further in terms, I think, again, your evidence was clear. Any follow-up questions for Mr Clark or for Mr Georgeson? No? Thank you very much. Thank you. So um, the next witness is a terrestrial ecologist, Ben Robertson. Checking is Ms. Blakely. Oh, here we go. Mm -hmm. And right. So I thought that I'd um, deal with terrestrial ecology first, and then when we deal with uh, uh, fresh water, have Josh Mark and Stu Parrott up together. Um, if that's convenient. So we'll start off with Ben. Welcome, Dr. Robertson. Thank you. Um, so I'll just summarise um, where we're at and give a brief overview from a terrestrial ecology as um, aspect. My evidence addresses terrestrial ecology values and effects in relation to the plan change proposal and the potential development at the site. The ecological expert conferencing resulted in a high degree of agreement among experts. The key issue raised during conferencing and reflected in the initial Section 42A report related to insufficient information on the structure plan pertaining to ecological values. As the panel is aware, an intensive, high, highly multidisciplinary effort has gone into revising the ecological provisions within the Maitahi Bayview structure plan with very helpful input from council submitters and their respective advisors, such that they now ensure the ecological values and biodiversity enhancement and connection opportunities are appropriately identified and provided for. The proposed plan change includes mechanisms that will afford environmental protection to a far greater level than is being undertaken under current land management uh, or could be achieved under existing rural zone. As shown on the structure plan, the rezoning proposal includes extensive open space, protected vegetation and revegetation area overlays, the purpose of which is to connect and restore existing ecological features and to recreate or strengthen ecological corridors and linkages across Kaka Hill, including existing significant natural areas, Kaka Hill tributary, Atafai, Matahi Ridge Line and adjacent coastal slopes. I estimate these will protect, enhance or restore almost two-thirds of the existing biodiversity or ecological values on the site and will provide wider ecological improvements. 
I note that areas not proposed to be protected, enhanced or restored under the plan change are predominantly improved pasture of very limited ecological value. I agree with Mr Milne and Mr Nicholson that the key natural characteristics of the site will be properly responded to, including by way of protections by the structure plan and overlays. With regard to terrestrial ecology, I consider the zones and overlays proposed and the placement of these protection layers across the site to be appropriate. I have considered the way the proposed structure plan has been designed, the intention of associated provisions to avoid development of in areas of ecological value and to restore ecological areas currently present and link these through further restoration activities. Given those factor, factors, it is my opinion that the Matahi Bayview plan change arrives at an appropriate balance of protecting areas of ecological value within the site, enhancing degraded habitat, creating new habitat and urban development of poor quality habitat with little ecological potential. The revised structure plan has also undergone refinement to address specific recommendations within the S42A report regarding management of actual and potential effects on indigenous vegetation types and native fauna, namely lizards and birds which may occupy or utilise the site. These provisions are outlined in the evidence of Mr Lyle. Somewhat relatedly, the, I have reviewed the recent submission of Mr Tony Haddon dated 11 July 2022 for Save the Maitai and note nothing included in his presentation has changed my opinion as set out in my primary evidence. I conclude by acknowledging the concerns raised by other, other submitters with respect to the ecological effects that may arise through future development of the site. Indeed, some of those comments provided by key submitters have helped to shape the latest version of the Maitahi Bayview structure plan. If the provisions in the structure plan are appropriately implemented, I consider that the positive ecological outcomes at the site and the wider catchment will be a market improvement on the current regime of pastoral farming with, lip, with no or only limited control on pests and plant animal species at, owner, at landowner discretion. Happy to address any questions from the panel. Thank you, Dr Robinson. Ms. Rick, do you have questions for Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Robinson. Robertson, sorry. Um, you mentioned positive benefits. Do you just want to briefly sort of summarise what those positive benefits you see from the development? Yeah, absolutely. In terms of terrestrial ecology, um, currently, particularly the area um, on the western, uh, along the western ridge line, um, on the Bayview Melbourne hillside, is currently pretty barren in terms of vegetation. So any vegetation would be a market improvement um, in those areas. Uh, likewise, um, within the riparian corridor, there's a mixture of exotic and native vegetation. A lot of that area has also um, been devegetated over time, lacking shade, um, lacking a lot of um, functionality that is required um, for ecological processes um, to occur um, and those revegetation efforts will allow for um, more natural ecological processes to occur across that site. Um, and in addition, by improving um, ecological connections uh, within the site will improve ecological con connectivity across uh, the ecological district as well. Thank you for that. Um, there's the clear green corridor that comes down the riparian, down the Kaka stream. There was also mention yesterday of um, connecting um, biodiversity links across the across the um, the ridge through over onto the western Malvern Hill. Um, but that isn't actually shown, I don't think, on the structure plan. And I guess I, my question is how valuable do you think that is in the context that once you get to the Atifai, current Atifai um, residential areas, there's actually, I don't think there's any um, native corridors that would actually take you down into the, down into the haven? Yeah, I certainly think that corridors are fundamentally important um, in terms of um, maintaining ecosystem function 
in, in, in such a large site. Um, I heard an issue yesterday around um, the proposed road on the master plan that might bisect those corridors. Um, in that regard, I don't see too much of an issue when corridors are, are separated by um, small sections of, of, of roads and the like. Um, I envisage the, the functional aspect of the corridors will be maintained, um, including for um, the movement of, of species um, through, the, through the landscape. Um, there are various practical and um, functional ways we can get around ensuring movement of species mm -hmm. through those areas as well, through um, fencing, funneling species into those areas and, and installing culverts under roads and allowing for safe passage of lizards, etc. Um, so yes, I, I view the um, corridors being an important aspect of the, of the, of the design. Thank you again. And um, a further question around, um, you, you mentioned the sort of implementation of what is in the, in the, in the plan. I noticed that in, um, in the schedule, in X4, X5 and X7, there are quite specific rules around plantings and the backdrop and the skyline and in the Esplanade reserves. Um, there's now been added um, those, uh, the, the rural revegetation zone. And you do mention, I think, in your evidence some suggestions in terms of how that um, should be managed. Um, but there is actually no rules within the schedule that relate to the um, rural revegetation overlay. Do you think that is needed? Um, my understanding is there is provisions providing for that at X16 um, as part of the Vegetation and Fauna Management Plan, um, which covers off uh, the vegetation within the residential green overlay and the red vegetation overlay aspects, um, including the provision for 100% indigenous species um, in general accordance with the planting pallets as set out at X4, X5 and X7. Just trying to find that at the moment. <clears throat> and we might pick up some of the, well Mr Lyle you might want to comment as well. Yeah there has been suggestion that um, there needs to be more detail in terms of what would be included in a vegetation um, and fauna management plan. I accept that's in there for, and, and it notes that would address the residential green overlay and the revegetation overlay. Um, but there has been the suggestion, I think, from the council expert that there should be some more detail in there in terms of what is required in that vegetation and fauna management plan. Sure. Um, my understanding of the I, I fully agree with the, the, the need for detail um, at the appropriate time. And I think there's a, an appropriate relationship between the X15 ecological assessment provision, which would essentially um, allow us to, to carry out an appropriate ecological assessment of the area, classify habitat types at an appropriate scale, um, identify present fauna, um, and provide appropriate mitigation recommendations, um, and that would come in the form of a, a fauna and vegetation management plan. It would be then that that detail would be included. Yeah, I'm not suggesting you need to include that detail in this document. The detail that I'm suggesting is that what needs to be covered in those, in those plans, and I do note as well that X15 actually does have a specific reference to potential threat to the values from domestic pets. Um, so I guess in that um, X15 rule there is that particular focus around pets, not that indication that it, it is a broader um, sure, I think assessment that, of biodiversity values. Sure, I think um, <laughs> we have just directly responded to Dr Tanya Blackley's recommendation um, within her uh, memo report there. I guess we could look at adding some further detail um, for clarity around those 
suit aspects. Great, thank you. Thank you. Before we start, can I ask Tony to please put up on the screen the indicative master plan, which I understand you have? Good morning, Mr. Robertson. Um, I've got some questions for you regarding the <coughs> um, terrestrial ecology aspects of the, um, the main Kaka Valley. Uh, sorry, it's the indicative master plan. I think um, Bev gave it to you this morning. Mr. Robertson, uh, my question is relates to <laughs> the 40 metre wide minimum width corridor um, adjacent to Karka Stream. And those parts of it which are, I guess, probably at about 40 metres, and that's from, can you see the word that says Karka Valley? I can't see it up on here, but do you have the master plan? If you had a copy of the master plan in front of you, I can, I can see that punch point, yeah, yes. Okay. Right, so that's probably a bit better than mine. So we have, <laughs> my question to you is how much discussion have you had with the stormwater uh, members of your team regarding the possible placement of attenuation devices, which might be detention dams, across the stream and within that area, which my understanding the 40 metres width um, is... I guess, prime, well, it's got two purposes. It's got an ecological purpose with both terrestrial and freshwater ecology. So I'm asking you from the terrestrial ecology, how much discussion have you had about uh, the appropriateness of putting, for example, the detention dam within that area, which might be an embankment, which can't have trees and perhaps um, has limited vegetation because it has an engineering function of actually storing water in, in a large event, so probably on the ponding side, you mightn't have much planting. Yeah, I've had um, some involvement in those conversations. Um, really, um, all I can say around the, the esplanade width um, aspect is that my, my opinion is what the wider the better. Um, subject to constraints identified at the detailed design stage. Um, I think there is some need for flexibility um, around the width, um, and as was discussed yesterday, um, and the ability to um, have those said stormwater devices, et cetera, within that area. Yeah. Um, the, need, the need for flexibility, flexibility by who? On what? <laughs> um, flexibility at the, at, the, at the detailed design stage to ensure yeah, yeah, that those, sure, sure, sure. there's capacity yeah, okay. for for, for whatever's required in terms of stormwater management. Um, I think there's a, there's a general consensus that um, there is capacity, there will be capacity um, for those aspects um, at, within the um, riparian. So in terms of your professional opinion on the values of that 40 metre width for terrestrial ecology, um, I've been involved in projects where there's instances of 
uh, stormwater treatment devices in riparian areas that um, provide an enhancement feature for terrestrial ecology um, if uh, implemented in the, in the right manner and planted in the right manner, et cetera. Yeah, so I guess your main point is you need to have flexibility and that the, the process that we've heard earlier, the resource consenting process, would address those that ecology is issues to make sure that, that the values of that, um, the terrestrial ecology values, were not compromised. I guess I'm just trying to, from a stormwater point of view, it's how far does the um, catchment management plan go, needs flexibility, but I'm just, um, I guess, trying to get some guidance about yeah, what, what would be acceptable in that, in that width in terms of a the tension dam or something. So, so you're saying provided it was um, landscaped or mitigated in some other way, it's a detention dam right across that area would be acceptable? Uh, certainly within reason. Um, I wouldn't, um, yeah, I, I'm, 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 I'm uncomfortable addressing that question to be honest. Um, it's probably perhaps better suited for um, Mr. Markham, um, who's dealing with the freshwater aspect and perhaps the... the um, yes, I, 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 I am distinguishing the terrestrial from that, so I, I understand what you're saying. I guess we've just heard how much it's been this, you know, intensive multidisciplinary approach, and there has been, I'm not doubting that, but I guess it's to, to the degree of that and how much that's going to input into the stormwater catchment plan to get a really good outcome. You know, we're talking about um, trying to get really good outcomes with, with revegetating that valley. Certainly going to be a, a huge benefit over what's happening now. I'm just trying to get some feel of that balance between the engineers are going to say, we need something there, you know, and you're still going to be able to get your terrestrial value. So I guess I'll put it back to you, perhaps, um, from what you understand, of the devices that might be needed, um, you think that they'll be able to be accomplished um, without too much compromise of terrestrial values? That is my view, um, and in particular given the currently degraded state where those of the environment where those um, devices would most likely be situated, then um, a net positive gain for terrestrial biodiversity is likely an out a likely outcome. Thanks very much. Ms. Benny. Just a question around um, the realignment of Kakahill Tributary in the lower reach and your comment there that you, um, in terms of freshwater eco ecosystems, obviously you've said that you agree with um, Mr. Markham and Mr. Ferrant's evidence, but to the extent it relates to terrestrial ecology, you said that you would support realignment. Can you? provide some more reasons around why you support realignment? Sure, my primary reason in terms of terrestrial um, values was um, I would support the realignment because there is an absent, absence of um, any real value in the realignment footprint. Um, so it's appropriate in that regard. And um, those riparian edges um, can be planted appropriately and provide for um, a positive ecological outcome in terms of terrestrial ecology um, as well. In, in, in a way that's better than dealing, uh, you know, plant, replanting the existing? Um, uh, not necessarily. Um, there's, there's, there'd, be a, there'd be a positive gain in, in both instances in terms of um, terrestrial ecology there. But I guess it's, it comes yeah. down to the trade-off between efficient urban design, um, those yeah. aspects that were discussed yesterday. But from your terrestrial ecologist perspective, you would support an option that ensured, you know, more gains in terms of terrestrial ecology, or, or provides an environment to allow. I don't know. I'm not talking about. I'm not asking you to make the trade-off as an expert. I'm asking you. Um, you've specifically said you support realignment, so I want to understand why realignment as opposed to what's the, what you know, leaving it where it is, and applying the planting in that place in situ. Yeah, I would support um, either option. 
realignment or leaving it as is, provided there was a there was a net gain outcome. Yeah. Okay. That's it. Thank you very much. Oh, actually, I just had a. I thought it was interesting your comment around the bats, um, because your point is that it's conceivable that the ecological values will be enhanced for native bats, and that's probably from more trees, more opportunities for roosting, etc. Um, notwithstanding the houses, is, is that more what you meant? Indeed. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Habitat creation. Yeah. It's currently not there. Tall trees, habitat that they require. Thank you. Just a quick further question around the realignment of the stream is do you, would there be any less terrestrial benefit from um, plantings next to the realign, proposed realignment compared to planting um, along the current alignment of the stream? Uh, my view is that the difference in gain between the proposed realignment and leaving it as is would be a probably less than minor um, difference in, for, uh, for, in terms of terrestrial ecology. Yeah. So there's no, what I guess I'm asking is there's no negatives in terms of replanting and terrestrial ecology around the, the realigned um, proposal compared to leaving it where it is? That's my view. My question's for Dr. Blakely. Um, Blakely, Blakey, how do you? Blake. Um, wearing, I mean, Blakely. Oh, it's on, I think. Excellent, thank you. Um, and sorry, the gentleman sitting next to you, just can you introduce yourself? We might have a question for you. I'm not sure who you are. Sorry, um, Kato, Paul Fisher, freshwater scientist. Oh, great, okay. Uh, Dr. Blake, yeah, I just, I've just, I mean, you've, you've heard Dr. Robinson's view and, and from his evidence, but of course you've produced um, the addendum to the 42A report, and I was just looking at that, and, and I've just gone to the conclusion, and I'd really just like your view, and in that conclusion at 34, you say, I consider the updated structure plan with, with the additional overlays may provide protection and enhancement opportunities, um, et cetera. And then you talk about the vegetation fauna management plan. Do you want to give us any advice, you know, now having seen the amended structure plan and heard the additional evidence, do you still have any outstanding concerns from a terrestrial ecological perspective? Because so I think you're, you're here in, in, across all of the ecology. Um, yes, I am um, casting my mind across all of the yeah, ecology. Yeah. So, um, just, so, so just focus, we're focusing on terrestrial, terrestrial for now. Terrestrial ecology yep. right now. Um, um, I think the matters that are still outstanding from my perspective are uh, the need to understand um, some of the aspects that we've discussed with Dr. Robertson um, around the purpose and the content of the fauna, vegetation and fauna management plan um, and how that is included in the structure plan and the... the right, okay. So, I mean, that's clearly a... Com it, well, correct if I'm wrong, that's clearly a combination of what you just said and, and sort of Ms Sweetman's role in terms of the planning element, so we can pick all that up. So it's not, a, it's not a fundamental disagreement, it's really a matter of how does this get delivered? Is that, is that, was that a fair representation? I or think the crux of it that, from right. an ecological perspective um, is that the, my understanding uh -huh. is that uh, elements of, of this proposal um, are around uh, protection and enhancement of ecological values, uh, including um, uh, the existing vegetation. So when we talk about terrestrial ecology, we're looking at the vegetation and habitats for fauna. Mm -hmm. um, and so from my perspective, it's really understanding how that uh, enhancement and protection would actually be enabled. Right, okay. Uh, particularly if, if there is reliance on, on those elements uh, for no net loss or net gain um, or of offset scenarios for right. climates. All right. So become the mechanism. Dr. Rock, do you want to make any? Com I mean, you have kind of. Do you want to specifically make any comment in terms of what Dr. Blake has just said? And again, we'll, we'll pick this up with the planning 
experts. Um, no, I think I've... You've covered it. You're happy yeah, with that. Feel, right. feel as I've covered that. Thank you very much. Nothing, any, thank you, Dr Blake. That's good. Anything further for Dr Robertson? Thank you very much. Um, thank you. I think this is, I mean, I think your next witness is coming in by Zoom, if I'm yeah. correct, and I, so I think it's probably a good time to take a break. Um, <clears throat> uh, so if we come back in at, uh, what time is it now? If we come back in, let's say, if we come back at 22, it'll give time to make sure the Zoom, the person's up on Zoom and, and it's all working appropriately. So we'll, we'll come back um, at 22. Thank you.
take off from. I'm approaching a bumper bridge. No, no, I was more nervous I was going to knock it over. <laughs> Statement, I think so, yeah. Yeah, You're always covering me. Thank you, everybody. We'll reconvene, Mr. Marston. Right. So, um, if we could just have the um, Zoom for Josh Markham to come on, and um, I'm pleased to introduce Stu Farrant, who's on water sensor oh, design, right. and those two uh, together, and then Morris is also here. Right. Morris Mills from Tonkin Taylor, right. um, who will also uh, present separately, but is here because. There yeah. are issues around online detention yeah. and <coughs> ideas about that that sort of mix with these experts. Um, so um, Josh and Stu are both going to um, prepare an opening statement. I have two supplementary questions that follow that, and then um, they're both sort of worked as a team in relation to the freshwater matters, so they can answer as they think fit your questions. So Josh, if you want to kick off. On mute. You're muted, I think. I can't hear you. Just the sound check again. Can you hear me now? That's right. Yes, thank you. Welcome. Yeah. Perf thank you. Um, also, just a bit of a note that uh, the volume on Zoom is a lot different than the volume on YouTube. So um, just for people in the room, if you could just speak quite loud and clear into your microphone, uh, that would be great. Thank you. So um, I'll, I'll just read quickly a, a summarised uh, verbal uh, statement that I've prepared and uh, run through that and then open to questions afterwards. 
Just, I just want to first start off acknowledging that I've prepared a statement of evidence and rebuttal evidence relating to potential effects of the plan change in terms of freshwater ecology. Uh, these included matters in terms of current ecological value of the site, the riparian margin, and proposed realignment of the lower Kaka stream. At this stage, I don't require any corrections or additions made to my, um, my statements. I was involved in the, just as a, a further acknowledgement, I was involved with pre-hearing formal discussions and conferencing with uh, Ms Blakely, uh, uh, Mr Young, and also Mr Robinson, as we've heard from before. The conferencing resulted in, in the terrestrial and freshwater Ecolo ecology joint witness statement, uh, which is dated the 13th of May, 2022. Um, I've also read uh, the statements of um, Ms Blakely, and also uh, Mr Young on freshwater ecological matters. The pre-hearing the pre and formal discussions and conferencing, um, in my mind, has been very positive and has uh, led to an um, iterative process which is now reflected in the illustrative master plan and the Kaka stream cross-sections uh, that were presented yesterday by uh, technical experts, uh, Mr Nicholson and Mr Milne. The, the PPC28 proposal and now updated proposal is a result of a collaboration of the multidisciplinary and integrative design. Uh, we've heard a lot uh, about that uh, yesterday and today. And I've just uh, heard a discussion from the panel about that this morning. Furthermore, the framework of rules or provisions as set out in the updated schedule X9 reflect best practice and will guide future subdiv subdivision consents, resulting in what has been envisaged through this plan change process. As reflected in my evidence and rebuttal evidence and based on the existing environment, I still retain the opinion that the proposed update on the PPC28 application will result in a positive ecological and, bi and biodiversity outcomes for the Kaka stream and also the wider Mai Tai River. From my perspective, and this is my perspective, is I believe that comments um, within uh, Ms Blakely's addendum evidence have been addressed, um, not only in the updated master plan uh, and cross sections, but also in uh, updates and revisions of uh, uh, provision X9. I also believe that the only outstanding matter that hasn't yet been resolved is the incorporation of the minimal riparian width um, in which no impervious services or other structures should be built within. At this stage, my comment on that is at this stage of the process and without detailed design being undertaken, I believe in such a restriction could result in unintentional consequences resulting in poor design through either landscape, urban water, or water sensitive design, or ecological outcomes, both terrestrial and freshwater. I believe that provisions in updated Schedule X9 reflect best practice in terms of design principles and should be re relied upon rather than a set width in which structures are not able to be built within. In summary, the information contained within the updated PPC28 proposal in evidence and rebuttal evidence of other experts combined with framework and rules provisions set out and updated schedule X9 provides su sufficient information for the proposed plan change and, will, and once again will result in the positive ecological and biodiversity outcomes envisaged through this process. On that point, I'm happy to answer any questions that people may have. All Thank right. you. Thank, oh, sorry. We'll just ask Mr. Uh, Farron to do his yes, thing. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And good morning. Um, yeah, it's on. Okay, so I prepared a statement of evidence relating to the potential effects of the proposed plan change in terms of water sensitive design um, and the potential impacts on downstream receiving environments resulting from that. This included discussions on stormwater management and works to protect and enhance the Kaka stream, and hence is crossover with both Mr. Mills and Mr. Markham. I also presented a statement of rebuttal evidence on the same topic and partook in conferencing. I do not require any corrections or additions to be made to my submitted statements. 
During conferencing and in sub subsequent evidence, there was general agreement that the existing site is subject to impacts related to rural land use and that there are nationally recognised methods, which are supported by technical guidelines, to appropriately manage stormwater from urban development to protect freshwater receiving environments. Generally referred to as water sensitive design, this approach takes a holistic approach to development planning to mitigate the impacts of water quality and quantity. The adoption of an approach to development grounded on water sensitive design has been in the intent from the outset from this team and has informed the Schedule X9 provisions which provide a clear statement of intent, I believe. Through conferencing, a request was made for the applicant team to prepare a stormwater management plan. This was subsequently prepared to demonstrate the high level feasibility of delivering on the aspirations for a water sensitive design approach which aligned with the X9 and national best practice. In preparing the, the stormwater management plan, there was refinement of the structure plan to reduce the extent of development and increase the extent of revegetation on the steeper slopes. I conclude that there are no reasons to suggest that the site cannot be designed and developed to support the stated intentions, which are to protect and enhance carcass stream and downstream receiving environments. Based on rebuttal and supplementary evidence, there remain some outstanding matters, um, which I'd summarise follow, as follows, and I know that you've already touched on quite a few of these, a number of these already. Um, the realignment of Lower Kaka Stream and corresponding ecological benefits. The suitability of stormwater treatment devices, such as wetlands or rain gardens, to be co-located within the broad Kaka Stream Green Corridor. Um, the understanding of specific hydrological and geomorphological conditions in Kaka Stream, to inform stormwater flow requirements such as retention and the level of information provided in the stormwater management plan to demonstrate the ability to achieve the X9 provisions. I also note that uh, Mr Salchik on behalf of Save the Matai um, has raised a number of queries relating to the impact of compaction and the effects on infiltration potential. This is addressed further by um, Mr Foley but I note that I see no reason to doubt the potential to achieve retention of stormwater through a combination of on-lot rainwater reuse and soakage. I note that it is my opinion that the realignment of Lower Kaka Stream can accelerate ecological and operational improvements through the immediate shading, which would take years to achieve in the existing or alternative alignments. Uh, Mr Markham will provide further discussion on this, I understand. Similarly, it is my opinion that the proposed green spine through the development is an optimal location to locate at least some of the expected um, consolidated treatment devices. It can be collaborative, these can be collaboratively designed to support wider community connections amenity and multifunctional spaces in line with the principles of water sensitive design. Mr Markham will also discuss this from an ecological perspective. Whilst it is noted that refined hydrological modelling of the Kaka stream will be required as part of future consenting, it is my opinion that based on the high level visual assessment of Kaka stream, positive effects of extensive revegetation of previously grazed land, low density across large areas of the plan change area and the commitment to provide retention of an initial stormwater depth from impervious surfaces the proposed residential development can mimic a more natural frequent flow hydrology to protect the stream. The level of information provided at this stage is a reflection of the conceptual level of design undertaken given the plan, the plan, state, plan change stage that we're at. Therefore, analysis has been based on demonstrating feasibility rather than providing explicit solutions, which will be developed as the design progresses through consenting, as has been discussed previously. Given the comparatively low density compared to many urban centres and extensive areas of undeveloped land, it is my opinion that the level of analysis demonstrates the ability to deliver development which demonstrates water sensitive design and provides an exemplar of good urban stormwater management. And I'm pleased to answer questions on <coughs> any of my evidence. <coughs> so I just have um, one, uh, two supplementary questions. This one's principally directed to uh, Mr Markham. Um, in terms of some questions arose earlier today about the relative benefits from a terrestrial ecology point of view between retaining the existing alignment and the proposed alignment. Um, what I'd like you to do is just very briefly summarise in a compare and contrast way the alternative uh, alignment proposed, recognising that this still needs to go through a consenting process and the counterfactual, which is uh, work on the existing alignment to accommodate the development so that there is a true comparison between both options and why you prefer the alternative. 
Okay, um, thank you. Um, so the existing alignment or current state of, of the lower Kaka stream is, is in my mind highly modified um, and at, at, in this stage doesn't reflect a, a naturalised uh, stream system uh, for, for the area. So therefore, if it was retained in, in situ and planted around, riparian planted around, the stream would have to be highly modified um, to, to become a naturalised stream. And when I talk about highly modified, I'm, I'm meaning um, in-stream uh, habitat placements um, and all of that design, the design principles that are envisaged through X9. I also believe if it did stay in the current state, uh, the, uh, a lot of extensive work would have to be done around it in terms of uh, flooding and um, our engineers uh, presenting after this will comment on that further. <coughs> so there, therefore, it's not just a case of planting the riparian margins and walking away from the stream in its current state. If we move the um, realignment as what the plan change is proposing, uh, a lot of work has gone into uh, that location in terms of working out and trying to understand um, if that location is where it could have been historically uh, through existing channels uh, on site. And also the benefits that um, Mr. Farron has just talked about as well is it being connected to and adjacent to existing vegetation, native vegetation, that has the benef extra benefits of shading, et cetera, to it as well. By moving it, we are able therefore to put in a whole lot of design into it to make sure that we can increase tenfold the in-stream habitats that are required. Thank you. Um, now, well, this is a question to either of you or both. Um, in a number of questions from Commissioner Mark Brown referred to uh, inline attenuation. Um, how do how do how do you conceptualise the use of structures uh, in those on inline locations? The sort of scale and the type of function that you anticipate and the location of them. Um, recognising that detailed design is not yet, uh, we're not at advanced detailed design stage. Yeah, I can, I can um, mm. jump in there initially. Um, yeah, so, so um, detention will need to address issues across the entire development area, mm. and that's likely to, to require a sort of a, a mixture in terms of, of the scale and location of those. And I guess having an element of, of detention which is online is potentially just one part of that. Um, I think in, in terms of how that would roll out, you would be working with the, with the urban designers and landscape architects in terms of finding locations where there are crossing points across the stream, such as roads or pedestrian crossings, and utilising those in a way that they can opportunistically provide detention in a certain scale of event. So we're not talking about large detention dams and, and large excavated detention areas, it's more areas where there's opportune floodplains that can provide some volume during, during particular return events and can be designed in a way that under normal conditions we have a, a, an entirely functional stream with fish passage provided through any, any protrusions through those, those structures really as a way to, I guess, um, be more efficient and, to, and to, to, to sort of, I guess, ensure that there's, there's floodplain um, characteristics within the stream as, as, as naturally occurring. Um, Mr. Mark, would you just have anything to add? Yeah, just a little bit further to uh, Mr. Farron's discussion just then is um, the design of those attenuation basins um, and the floodplain characteristics that we can provide do include native revegetation. So that, that's an important part. They're not going to be mown grass um, or areas, right. they will be lots batch of vegetation as uh, plain, and I think that that's a really important point because that vegetation will knit together with other proposed uh, vegetation within the riparian margin. Any other devices within that riparian margin 
um, we propose to set back from the stream. There's been comments also uh, by the panel about planting in engineered slopes um, around these devices. So we're proposing to, in detail design, to step them away from the channel, allow tall stature vegetation to be planted close proximity to the stream to provide that shading necessary, and then native vegetation, shallow rooted, low stature around the wetlands in the outer riparian margin. So I think that's an important point to make as well. Thank you. I'd just um, both be available to answer any questions, thanks. Thank you, Ed. Ms Rack. Thank, thank you both. Um, Dr Mark, I have a question for you. Just going back really to, I guess, the big picture, you commented that you are convinced that there are positive benefits to Karka Stream and the wider Maitai Valley from the, or Maitai River, from the um, pain change. Could you just summarise for us what those benefits are? Yeah, i um, flattered by calling doctor, but I um, just want to clarify that I, I don't have a PhD. Um, but thank you for that. Always better to um, be so, on that yeah. side. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I just, yeah, so the positive ecological uh, benefits and, and, and also biodiversity benefits include um, the this, this step change from the current existing environment, which is a open riparian margin that's not fenced from stock. Stock have complete access to it in terms of pugging uh, and also um, uh, defecating in the stream, which high coli then washes downstream into Penny's Hole. Um, and also, you know, stream erosion as well in the lower catchment. So the, the ecological benefits, the benefits that we, we proposed are the, the riparian planting margin, uh, which is uh, the uh, result in stream shading. Uh, also, the benefit of infiltration of overland flow uh, through the riparian margin. Um, the also green corridor for species to travel up. Um, for instance, uh, in the uh, supporting uh, report, uh, which is the Ecological Opportunities and Constraints report, and then um, reiterated in my evidence, is the difference between a riparian margin with overhanging vegetation and no riparian margin is very stark on, on the site at the moment in terms of the macroinvertebrate community composition. With that riparian margin, with shading, with the input of uh, detritus, uh, which is the those natural processes, we get an increase uh, uh, in uh, macroinvertebrate uh, composition uh, that also allows greater food source for in-stream um, uh, native fish as well. So, Thank you. Yep, that's a fairly comprehensive list. Stream. So, so can I just, just, just quickly add something there and, and just note that I'm not a water quality science but I just draw um, attention to the, the work that was done around the, the water quality monitoring. Um, which was admittedly only for a 12-month period from October 2020 to November 2021, and that quite clearly um, found that there's a significant um, worsening of E. coli in particular through the, the current development site. So they had a, a water quality monitoring site above the proposed development and, and essentially at the confluence just before Denny's Hole, and there was a market under current land use reduction in E. coli, which obviously has pretty big significance from a, a contact recreation perspective. Thank you. Um, just looking at the other questions, some of which I have here, which you've um, probably answered already. Um, yeah, there is the, there's the question of the wider Maitai Valley. Um, I mean, in a, I mean, one of the concerns is in a flooding situation. Um, what would be the relative contribution from Karka Stream and the Maitai um, above the Karka Stream confluence? into the areas where the swimming holes are? Contribution of uh, flood, flood levels or contribution of sediment load? Um, both, if that's not an unfair mm. question to ask. Um, yeah, I just want to 
um, point out that I'm an ecologist. Um, <coughs> you will be talking to um, engineers very shortly and they can cover off the, the flood levels um, because that's out of my uh, area of uh, expertise and you wouldn't want me to talk about um, flood levels at all. But from a sediment point of view is, um, I believe from an ecological point of view, is the sediment contribution from the wider catchment is much, wider Mai Tai catchment is much greater uh, than under the proposed uh, design of the Kaka Hill catchment. Um, there will be no stock in the water. There will be um, riparian planting. There will be stabilised stream banks. Um, compared to what's going on at the Matai Valley as well. Okay, I'll leave that one for now. And uh, just if I just take this moment to expand that point, uh, am I breaking up or you can, can you hear me clearly? You are breaking up a bit, but it seemed, well, I think we're getting the message okay. Okay. The, the margin, um, you mentioned the minimum of 20 metres which on, each, on both sides, which you said is still an area of um, difference, I guess, between you and the, the council expert. I notice in, in, the, um, in, her, it's in her addendum, section 42A addendum appendix E, in paragraph 10 she comments, um, should in, the management of the riparian corridor should include the exclusion of, oh no, sorry, that's not the right spot, um, maybe. Um, anyway, the comment is that um, where 20 metres on each side, where topography and geological features allow, and that seems to me to be a reasonable approach, which is that, that you have tw a minimum of 20 on each side, which doesn't have any hard surfaces, and you know you're not putting cycle paths or walking paths or other infrastructure in it subject to it being where the topography and the geological features allow. Would that not seem reasonable? Yeah, um, I guess I just flip that around as if the provisions in the X9 were tightened uh, that um, setback uh, because the, the final design uh, would be designed to what's envisaged in uh, Schedule X9. Um, my, the, the issue that I, I have, and I'll reiterate, is the fact that putting a hard exclusion in may have unintentional consequences. If we word that in terms of um, as far as practical or um, have exclusions in it, uh, I don't. I think that waters down the statement, um, and I don't think it's needed. You, we're better off to turn our mind to the the wording and writing of the provisions in X9. Um, any comment on fish passage and potential use of culverts um, in the overall infrastructure through the stream? The only comment is, is that we've been very clear and, and open that any structures within the stream need, need to provide fish passage. And that's, clear, that's been clearly stated. And there shouldn't be any problems in doing that? No. Okay, thanks. I think that's all questions from me for the moment. Just, just as a point of clarification, I've just pulled up the information you asked around the relative scale. Um, based on based on modelling, the Kaka stream at 100 years is around about 25 to 30 cumex, whereas the Mai Tai is between 300 and 400. Right, so we're, we're sort of around about 7%. Um, and also we don't have sediment loads for the Kaka, but the, <coughs> the Mai Tai is, um, is average um, annual loads around about 500 cubic metres. Um, so a significant bed load of, um, of sediment that comes down. Thank you. Thank you. Mr Mark Run. It is. Good morning. My, um, I just want to give a bit of background about <coughs> my approach and my questioning. So I, I've had a lot of experience in um, 
preparing, helping to prepare, reviewing catchment management plans, and relatively recent greenfield development in Drury in Auckland, which is quite different topography, but very similar issues that we are now looking at in terms of what does a catchment management plan do, the high level, how is that transferred down to a resource consent? And just recently, even the last few weeks, so I'm, I'm very familiar with these mechanisms, I just want to sort of give that background. So I'm trying to come from a, a practical point of view, certainly don't want to um, get into, into theoretical. I acknowledge the amount of work that's been done and I feel confident that um, the technical work that's been done allows a good understanding of the hydrology of, of the area. <coughs> I guess to me, in looking at the draft catchment management plan and the uh, provisions in the plan, I think there's still a few gaps that need to be sort of tightened up or, or reviewed. Um, so I'll start with Mr Markham. First, in your um, rebuttal evidence, power 14, you talked about preference for stormwater devices to be offline. So you still have that preference? He's, <coughs> he's frozen. Um, yes, that's, that's oh. correct. That, that will still be my pref. Can, can you hear me now? Yes. yes. So, so on um, that and perhaps then bringing Mr Markham in, you know, we, you, we, we've been told by the applicant lots of times. Just, been, we just, just broke a whole point. So is Mr Markham still there? Yep, I'm, I've just turned my video off. Oh, to good. Try okay, to, that's uh, fine. Thank better, you. Yeah, that's what happened. I just saw a check. Better bandwidth. Yep. Okay, we've been told about the multidisciplinary approach, and then Mr. Farrant, I um, heard what you said about um, until you do the detailed design, you don't know where these de detention devices will go. Understand completely, but I guess my question is, um, in terms of the catchment management plan, I, I would have hoped that you would have perhaps got a bit further on saying. Detention dams um, either need to be online or, or won't be, or, or getting some refinement there. And I see that in the X9, the preference is to have these <coughs> devices within the 40 metre wide plane, I can understand that. But it seems to me that there's a <coughs> potential conflict with the national policy statement on fresh water, which that we've heard the movement is to really make sure we look after these streams and I would have thought that even the carcass stream even though it's probably not so good now it's going to be a lot better and we need to be very careful of minimising um, minimising obstacles I know we can do fish passage but surely shouldn't one objective be to minimise any obstructions in that stream for fish given that in hopefully 20 years' time it's going to be a hell of a lot better and it might have a lot more fish in it. So I perhaps just, this is just the first of many questions, perhaps just ask a response from two of you on that question. I'll, I'll just jump in firstly there and just as a point of clarification, I think there the, the, the could be a tendency to mix up stormwater devices um, and online, offline because... Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm not mixing that. I, I understand the difference and I'm actually talking about, on, at the moment, what you were saying about detention dams. I okay, suggested detention. detention. Yeah, I just wondered whether Mr Markham was also referring to things such as wetlands, which we have said would all be offline. Well, good point, and, and, and perhaps that needs, yeah, that needs perhaps clarification from Mr Markham. So perhaps I, I need to be clearer. So my understanding is that, Mr Markham, is that Mr Farrant is saying that they want the flexibility to have um, detention dams online you're saying you've got a preference for things to be offline. Can you not, is there not possibility of reaching some sort of agreement on this between you or, yeah, I guess that. Yeah, thank you. I think there's a bit of clarification on my point of view <coughs> in, in, what, in terms of what I mean. Um, so what I mean in terms of offline, um, that is stormwater wetlands. Uh, devices such as, as stormwater wetlands. Um, I wouldn't, I'm not an advocate and I never have been of putting those devices online due to fish passage, due to, due to the heating of, of water and the discharge of overheated water, which Mr Ferrant um, has also agrees with. 
Um, the online detention dam is, is slightly different and I've been involved um, over the years with design of them. Um, it is possible to put them online to still retain fish passage through them and a naturalised stream channel through them. Um, commenting on, on what Mr Ferrant said before about the in, within the detention basin, they will be designed to, to have a naturalised floodplain and look and vegetation to them. So for all intents and purposes, at low flow, uh, the channel through them will be operating as a natural stream channel with no restriction to fish passage. Mr Ferrant, have you got anything further so to just, say about the design principles? <coughs> so if I could just jump in there. So there's no restriction to fish passage, but it will be through a culvert. So are you saying that um, the technology in terms of designing culverts for fish passage means that you're not at all worried about culverts that might be, I don't know, 10, 20 metres long on that stream? Yeah, so I, I don't know if Mr Markham's got comment on that, but yeah, I mean, there's, there's um, recently prepared guidelines around the design of culverts for fish passage, and there's ways to obviously embed below the, the channel bed and, and maintain a gravel um, course. Um, and to design those for the, the range of species that we'd expect in that catchment. So, um, yeah, I, I certainly have my opinion that there is a way to do that, but I, I would just want to emphasise that, that any, any de ultimate detention strategy needs to be looked at at a, at a whole development scale, and this could be one part of it, but we're not, we're not suggesting that it's the only part of it. No, I know, but um, the whole your, your thrust of most of what you're saying, including if we go to to um, X9, where, where possible, integrate peak flood controls within the blue-green spine. So, so you are sort of, my concern is you are sort of saying that preference. And I would put back to you as an engineer that best practice perhaps may be to avoid online detention <coughs> if you can. So, sometimes you can't, but if we go back I was wondering, Tony, could we have the master plan? Indicative master plan up, please. Have you got that there, um, Mr. Farrant, the, the master plan? Uh, not, not directly in front of me. I could. Could you grab get a copy quite of that? quickly? Get the master plan there, John. Yep. And, and just, I guess, for, for another slight point of clarification, um, there's crossover there because there's obviously the technical ability to design things such as constructed treatment wetlands, which also provide a detention function. And so if those are co-located within the, the green spine, that doesn't mean that they're necessarily online to the stream, but they're within that corridor. And no, that's, no, we believe that's for no, some Thank you. I, I understand that difference. I just wondered it might be useful to talk to a particular, seeing we've got a master plan, you know, and a likely layout, and given the narrowness of the, the valley, we're looking where that says Karka Valley, I'm looking at the area upstream there as perhaps, you know, a good working example, if you like. So you've got a, an area that will be urbanised and piped, and then that will come down to the downstream end, and at that point you'll have a choice. Well, I guess overall you've got a choice with the tension, you could have it on, individual houses, but then there's problems with that because council has to look after all those. Preference, you've said, is for um, discrete devices, which makes sense. So you've got a device to go round about where it says Karka Valley. Then you've got the choice, does it go in the green in the space or do you have to build it with an area which could otherwise be for lots? The uh, developer will be saying, we want the maximum yield there'll be pressure on the designer to not have it in there and to have it in the green space. So I guess I'm just perhaps being devil's advocate in a way that um, I'm cons I guess I have some concern that number 11 and X9 says flood controls within the blue-green spine. Perhaps can you just respond to that? Um, can I just give him the relevant um, provision uh, so that he can <coughs> have it? Yeah. Sorry, yeah. Um, X9... Yep, 11. Yep, 11. Yeah, no, I've got that, got that in front of me. Um, and I would just point out that I think Mr Mills um, is, is probably a better place to yeah. speak to the, the specifics of this. Sure. Um, but I think the, the where feasible is, is not suggesting that under all circumstances we would be 
looking at doing that. There's obviously a whole lot of engineering and, and like you yeah, rightly point out, operational considerations that would come into play. Okay, I'll go back to my previous question, which perhaps I didn't finish. But would it not be, in, in your view, as a water sensitive design expert, that, that the, generally there should be preference to avoid online detention if possible? My professional opinion is that that's not necessarily um, always the case. Um, I think there are, there are times where we can utilise um, online detention um, in, a, in a way that it's, you know, when that's engaged and how long that's engaged for, you know, what's planted in and what effectively becomes floodplain habitat is really important. So in my opinion, there are, there are certainly plenty of times where, where that would provide the most optimal outcome, but that doesn't mean that you would pursue that everywhere um, as, a, as a sort of a blanket approach. And, and I think that as long as, as you know, those, those really strong requirements around, around things like fish passage um, and you know, natural stream design and, and protection of the stream you know, ecological function are in play, um, you know, there's, there's no, you know, I guess the principles of water sensitive design are around um, things like co-locating and multiple benefits. So I think in an urban environment that's, that's entirely um, appropriate. Okay, I think um, going back to um, Mr. Markham, I'm not sure whether um, he answered my question. Or there was that break up, so I'll just ask it again. If it's quite a long, cul if if there's a, a need to put a long culvert in as part of an online detention, I understand about fish passage guidelines. I know, I know what they mean and, and how they work. But from an overall point of view, in terms of NPS FM, trying to it seems to me that we need to be trying to um, avoid, if possible, any um, things that can go wrong with letting fish go up there. Is he happy with a, a long culvert going in there as part of a flood detention dam from a freshwater ecology point of view? Yeah. Um no, I, I understand the question. Um, it depends on how long the culvert is. And the, the short answer, yes, I am happy. I'm very confident that we can design culverts that fish can go through in terms of the, the parameters that Mr. Farrant just mentioned about embedding the culvert into, into the ground significantly to allow natural uh, materials through the culvert, to slow down velocities, to allow fish to get through. So it depends on the parameters of the culvert the width of or diameter of the culvert, how much it's sunken in, and how long it is. So if we're talking about a culvert that's between seven metres and 20 metres long, that there's no doubt that we can maintain fish passage through that culvert. If we're talking about a culvert that's a kilometre long, yeah, then, then we start having issues. I just want to sort of reiterate and point uh, to a comment that Mr. Ferrant said about utilising existing cross or, or potential crossings uh, for choke points to allow that attenuation. And so therefore we'd want to try to maximise the use of, it, of, of proposed culverts that are going in for crossings for that point. So we're not doubling up or duplicating culverts um, where it's not necessary. Thanks very much. That's a, that's a very good point. So um, I guess perhaps to you and to Mr. Farrance, do you see that perhaps an issue like that would be useful to come through in the stormwater management plan or even in these provisions? You know, we're talking about um, culverts across it. From I can see from the um, indicative master plan, there's only one crossing shown. That's the main road at this stage. So are you referring to maybe having some, some tighter provisions in the stormwater management plan or? Well, either in the stormwater management plan to, to talk about what Mr. Markham said, which was to minimise the number of crossings or yep. culverts, or, or in the stormwater management plan, or both. Yep. Yeah, because I guess the, yeah, the one, yeah, there is obviously uncertainty with, with final yeah, location of, say, pedestrian crossings, which is another place where you, you obviously have a, a crossing point. Yeah. Um, and and you're know, working with um, you know, the landscape architects and urban designers. You know that can be the difference between locating that in one location and another can obviously have those those follow-on benefits for for the stormwater management that we're talking about here. 
Yeah, and I think this, you know, the stormwater, we're going to talk about that more with, with um, later on, but it's a work in progress and it's, it, it needs to be kept on refining and addressing these particular issues. So, yep. yeah. I, I would also just point, you mentioned, um, you mentioned um, Nelson City Council or, or Council and you know, on lot um, provisions. You know, there certainly are councils around the country that are requiring detention to be provided at a lot scale. You know, and there's some, some real questions around the, the merits of that from a redundant, you know, having an empty tank in your house all the time. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, solutions like that are still in the mix, but that needs close work at a consenting stage with the appropriate officers at, at uh, Council. I'm sorry to do this to you, but somebody needs to tell you at some stage that um, you get your principals and your principals <laughs> mixed up. It does I've annoy been told many times. It's <laughs> perhaps my problem because my mother was a school teacher, so I'm aware of that. Noted. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so in your evidence in chief, you, you said that X9 provides clear and transparent standards to ensure protection of carcass stream. Now, I do actually, I do challenge you on that. I don't, I don't know that it, provi it provides some standards, but I guess this is part of the point of how much does the catchment management plan need to show? And we've talked about that as a panel already and acknowledged that it is, it's some, well, the, the existing catchment management plan is a high-level document, but it's important that, our, I guess, our feeling at this stage is that it really um, encapsulates the outcomes. So you're talking about standards, but really probably the only standard in X9 is the, the first flush of, of uh, treatment, and the rest of the things are protect and advance, and that sort of thing. So can you please re respond on that? Yes, yeah, so I guess I mean I was going to draw your attention to that because I think that in itself um, does capture a pretty strong intent to to ensure that all of site generated stormwater is captured and treated, which is a significant progression on what's currently required in the Nelson area. Sorry, just just on that, if we look at number five and X nine, yep, it, it's not particularly clear. It, it says it's the Kaka stream, so it's excluding. The, the, catchments, the catchments that drain to the west, isn't it? Yep, yep, yep. that's a fair point. Well, you just, just said it's all. So yep. I'm not trying to catch you out, but I think this, that's an example where it's not particularly clear to me reading this as a person who's used to reading st st catchment management plans. My worry is at the moment it's not going to be necessarily be clear to yep. the next tier down looking yep. at it at the time of consenting. So yep. um, I think you know it needs. They need more work, and I guess we could talk about later with uh, with the chairman about how that happens. But I mean, from my point of view, these these need more work now to get what you guys want. I understand mm. um, what what you're trying to do, and I and I think there's certainly ability to do it, but it's like getting that guidance at the right at the right level. Yeah, and, and I would just um, just highlight there the challenges that that presents and how that's tackled elsewhere. Um, so if if we look at, at places such as um, Auckland with the with the unitary plan, yeah. Um, yeah, they don't they don't necessarily have strong standards there. Rather, a requirement to conform with certain design guidelines. Yeah. Um, and you know, other other councils across the country and including um, Nelson at the moment um, have have pretty weak standards in terms of um, only requiring treatment for high traffic yeah. roads, for instance, and then not really being specific about what that standard of that treatment is. So I would, I would uh, suggest that, and, and take your point around um, you know, the western sides of the hills, but in terms of the carcass stream, having a, having a requirement to treat a particular volume of water or a particular um, return event 
is is on par with with um, you know, the likes of the unitary plan, um, just expressed in a different way, um, and certainly in, in exceedance of what's currently required. So just on that, going back to the western side of the hills, Mel, um, and the no no treatment provided. So you are. I mean, it gets a little bit confusing at, at some stage because there's various people looking at different things, but that's your bailiwick, the stormwater quality side of it. So what's your, you know, we, we, again, we, I go back, we're hearing it's all best practice and going to be great for everyone, but you're not going to be treating the stormwater from that area. Is that right? Uh, that's, that's not, I mean, obviously, as we've said um, a number of times, everything needs to go through a consenting process. Um, at the moment, under the um, under the, the, the Nelson um, Resources Plan and the and the Land Development Manual, um, you wouldn't actually need to treat stormwater on that side because they're low traffic roads and um, and you can deal with roofs through inert building materials. Um, I'd suggest that we would go go beyond that at, at the consenting time. Um, and yeah, there are also some some topographical constraints there that may mean that you might need to use things like proprietary stormwater treatment devices and things like that. Um, so, yeah, so, yeah, so I mean, I was... Just coming back, you said you'd at the resource consent time look at that, but there's no guidance at the moment in, in, in the, in the uh, stormwater management plan, all these provisions to do that. So, I mean, I, I hear what you're saying. It sounds yep. a really reasonable approach, but again, how, you know, yep. where, where's the guidance to help when it comes to the consenting stage that this is what you were thinking? Yes, I think that's something that we can we can clarify um, through the through the stormwater management plan would be the appropriate place to do that. I just step out. I, one thing I think we're signalling, and I think we signalled early on, is that you know in terms of the provisions which have been provided have clearly attempted to address a whole lot of issues, and it's all been put in here. And I think what we're really signalling is at this stage we're not, sh and I think Ms. Sweetman has the same view, not quite sure it all hangs together, and so we'll sort of point out the areas we think might need some more work and we then may need to send the experts off to have a look at that. We understand that the council's position is in relation to stormwater management plan that it's sufficient as far as it goes but it needs more information when it goes through the consenting process and we're certainly content to provide a list of the additional information that would be required as part of mm complying with this document and I think we're working on that exercise. Mm -hmm. So we think the council's view is reasonable that you have to signal the sort of information you would expect to come through. Um, but uh, in terms of outcomes, um, hopefully the ST SMP does actually um, specify pretty clearly what those mm -hmm. are. <clears throat> we'll continue on the theme and I think that's where we'll end, end up having some of those discussions. Yes, so um, in your evidence in Chief Power 25, you talked about um, site-generated stormwater from developed residential areas shall be managed for contaminants, including nutrients, which did surprise me a bit. I mean, generally my understanding with urban areas, nutrients, nutrients aren't a big issue, um, cats and dogs and stuff. So I'm just, can you just explain why nutrients are in there and is that what's going to be required? Yes, yeah, certainly um, comparatively to, to rural land use, nutrients are not of the same magnitude in terms of an issue, but in terms of compared to a natural environment, they are. So there are elevated nutrients in stormwater that are a mix of a reflection of what's going on on the land. So, so you know, gardening activities, you mentioned animals, um, all of the usual, um, but also um, atmospheric nitrogen, which is, which is naturally in rainfall, which is naturally assimilated within, within forest cover and things. So the, the reason for that is, is that stormwater is really efficient at gathering all that up and putting it into one place. So nutrients is, is a key part of, of managing urban stormwater um, alongside the more sort of, you know, I guess, traditionally understood um, you know, metals and sediments and the like. Well, again, it's another example. I don't see that as in your evidence. I don't see that in the SMP, so I guess it's another, yep. another thing. So I did have a question on para 31 of your evidence in chief which talked about wind-derived contaminants. So is that the, the nitrogen from rainfall, is that what you mean? 
Well, that, that's just a mixture. Um, I mean, that's, that's you know, if you are closer to a road, there's, there's obviously um, vehicle-related dusts and things, there's sediment, um, and it's the sort of stuff that in a natural environment, you know, falls on the leaves and, and you know, goes into the loam, but, but the, the nature of stormwater is it's then very efficient at picking that up and moving it to the receiving environment. So, um, yeah, again, it's, it's not a big component compared to, say, a, a high-traffic road, but it's important when we're dealing with a sensitive environment. And probably my final question that you'll be pleased, it's the last one. Um, Power 34 of your evidence in chief, you talked about stormwater treated to the best practical standard. Now again, I'm having trouble with the word we have best practical option, but best practical standard, again, it's that word standard. So I guess it's a, more of the same. Um, yeah, and, and it's, it's something that I um, struggle with, to be fair. I've, I've been working in this industry for a long time and, and worked with you know, a lot of the, the researchers that, that underpinned early water sensor urban design from out of um, various universities in Australia in particular. Um, and there is a point where we cannot treat 100% of all heavy metals. You know? So you are, when I say practical, it's, it's, it's actually lining up with what is regarded as, as best practice, which is generally around that treating that, that three month return interval and through using the best um, sort of nature-based technologies that we have, which are better than, than, than the more sort of engineered solutions, the, the resulting contaminant reduction you get there. So you're really targeting the, you know, the small, highly contaminated events, um, and you're not kidding yourself that you're able to actually you know, remove 100% of those contaminants. I do have a lot of uh, comments on the, the draft. Um, stormwater management plan, which I was planning to go through with Mr. Mills, so I won't, because you didn't, you weren't an author of that, but you, you are familiar with that? Yes, yes I am. Okay, well I'll leave that, but you will still be around at that time, so I mean I think that's, we are in some sort of process of, you know, trying to, to move on with these, with these mechanisms, so thanks very much for that. Yep, no problem. Mr. Um. <laughs> Now, having heard from the bad cop, I'll just, I'll just be a good cop. I, I just had a simple question, but um, before I go there, I just want to acknowledge Mr. Markham. Thank you very much for the comments you made um, at the outset in response to a, a question from supplementary question from council, uh, because I think that really helps to substantiate your comment and your evidence regarding. Um, you know, the proposed realignment you say would result in substantially greater ecological outcomes when compared to its current alignment. Uh, so that was my main question, and I think you've covered that off um, very helpfully at the outset, so thank you for that. Um, Mr. Ferrant, I just uh, note that you received a Winston Churchill Fellowship in 2018. Um, and way back when, probably about 2010, I was a board member of the Winston Churchill Trust, and so it's always really, I'm always pleased to see fellows. Uh, who have achieved a scholarship, who have travelled overseas extensively and really put into effect their learnings from their journey um, and to see the contribution that that makes to environmental guidance in New Zealand and the direction of travel. So um, just mihi atu ki kui and acknowledging you for that. Thank you. Um, and my question, after all that, is probably as it turns out for, Mr. Uh, for Dr Robertson, um, but there's an overall, in, in terms of X6 and buildings on Kaka Hill, it talks about the rules um, ensuring that the ecological values of Kaka Hill are protected long term. So I wanted to understand what are the existing ecological values of Kaka Hill, and when we're talking about when X6 talks about protecting those ecological values, is it the existing ecological values, or is it taking into account the planned restoration that's to occur? It's probably for Dr. Robertson. Sorry. <coughs> Um, it's essentially a, 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 a function of both, so it's a, it's a um, protection of the vegetation type that is there currently, which is predominantly Kanoka, a threatened nationally critical species, um, and also enhancing that, those areas through planting um, that will ultimately come up through that pioneer species being the Kanoka um, and 
Yes, and there's also the protection of the significant natural area uh, okay. that exists out there too. Yeah, so we've got natural character values there, landscape values, and talking about ecological values. And it, the restoration work that's to come on Kākahil, is it Ngāti Kuata who will carry that out, or is it the applicant? I'm not sure I'm the person to be asking. Okay. Ngāti Kuata. Okay, so right. thank you for clarifying that. Kia ora. I don't, excuse me, I don't have any other questions. Um, I'm just going to, just to the council team, I think in all of that, I think it's going to be better that you have a more of a considered response and we'll come back next week rather than kind of do what we've been doing sort of back and forward. So um, I think, um, thank you to, to both those witnesses. Um, I think as um, Mr Mark Brown indicated, it would be quite good for these witnesses to remain because, again, when we yeah. put questions to Mr Mills, there may well be crossover questions again. So. Do you want to call Mr Mills next, or do you, I mean, we've got, you've got, yeah, uh, yes, because Mr. Do, I, do we need to call Damien to put you as well? Yeah, yeah we probably prefer to call um, oh, sure. Mr. Just, Villa Pula, yeah, I think like. Just, sorry, one second. Yeah, yeah, just, sorry. Could I just, I just sorry. like to have, a, I have a question <coughs> for Dr Blakely. Um, in your um, uh, Appendix E Ecology, um, I think it's the addendum report, um, you comment on the realignment of Kaka Stream and say that you question the premise that it's the only or best option to achieve ecological enhancement. And we have heard from um, Mr Markham that he, he um, is sure that it is, is the best option. Are you still of the view that you are not um, sure of the premise that it is the best option for restoration of the, or realignment is the best option for the stream ecology? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I think to summarise um, my view on that, uh, I think um, that uh, realignment is not necessarily the, the only option for enhancement. I certainly heard what Mr Markham had to say about the, um, I guess, the, the level of activity that might be required to enhance Kaka Stream in its current alignment. Um, which would include um, certainly uh, potentially regrading of banks and those sorts of things to result in um, improved in-stream habitat conditions. Um, but I think that I, I don't I don't believe that there's sufficient evidence or information currently to understand for me to um, to weigh up those um, costs and benefits. So can I just jump in there and, and excuse me for being an engineer, but um, just raise some operational um, um, considerations. Um, I think that the, the, the shading is a, is a critical thing for, the, for the, 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 um, the management of these streams. And I know that across Nelson and, and through into Richmond, there are many streams where um, the councils struggle with the management of exotic weeds, um, which is a direct reflection of the, of the shading. And so I, I do think it is worth recognising the benefit that the existing shading on that realignment would have on both the, you know, the in-stream values but also just thinking about that operational um, response which typically results in them using herbicides within waterways to control things like you know, wild celery and stuff so yeah. I think it is valid. Thank you for that. And again, I think we will get a considered response from the council on that. And, and I just want to make clear again to all parties and, and, and Mr Marston made that point clear, you know, we are not here determining whether the stream is to be removed. We're really determining what is the appropriate objective and policy framework. Um, and I think there's no contention between any of the parties that there should be a, res a restore and enhance kind of um, um, outcome. I think the question that comes back is whether there's a policy base that supports the realignment or whether we are silent on that and it's determined through the consent process. So I, I think it's at that level that we, you know, it, it's an evidential base and we'll need to make that determination once we've heard all the evidence. All right, so um, I would also ask um, Mr. Villa Pillai to, Pillai to join us by Zoom. With oh, he is he here now? Would you like to go to him straight away or do you want Mr. Mills first? Uh, well, I thought we could do the both together. Okay, fine, sure, that's good. Um, 
We might. We can take down. Thank you. Can you hear me? I'm on yeah. online. I can hear you. Thank you, and we can hear and see you. Thank you. All, all right, Damien. I'll just get Morris to um, start off, and then you can do. Good morning. Um, I prepared a statement of evidence relating to the potential effects of proposed plan change 28 on water supply, wastewater and stormwater to support the PPC 28 application and co-authored with Mr Byron Munro the stormwater section of the stormwater management plan submitted as part of my evidence. I also prepared a statement of rebuttal evidence on stormwater. I do not require any corrections to be made to, to my submitted evidence. As part of pre-hearing conferencing discussions, joint witness statements were prepared for water supply and wastewater. It was agreed that the measures proposed in the PPC 28 application are appropriate to service the development, and I do not propose to make any further comment on water supply and wastewater. However, I am happy to answer any questions you may have. Um, the main outstanding matters of contention between the various experts relate to the proposed provisions for on-site management of stormwater, quantity and quality, effects of the downstream receiving environment with particular emphasis on the Matahi River, and insufficient information provided in the stormwater management plan to support the PPC 28 application. The assessment of effects of stormwater from PPC 28 within development and the receiving environment has been an evolving process throughout the master planning process, consisting of a multidisciplinary approach, which included inputs from urban design, landscape, ecology, stormwater, water sensitive design and flooding. As a result of the pre-hearing conferencing discussions, a stormwater management plan, I'll just refer it to the refer it to as that's the SMP for now on, um, has been submitted by the applicant. The SMP has taken a conservative approach to assessing stormwater runoff quantity by applying a percentage impervious area for each zoning area. Uh, this method assumed that the full extent of each zoning area would be developed and did not consider any effects of topography or design which may limit development intensity. This gave an overall impervious area for the PPC 28 of 22% or 65 hectares. After the SMP was issued, a master plan has been prepared for the PPC 28 identifying a conceptual subdivision layout. The impervious areas were recalculated using the master plan layout, giving an overall impervious area of 16% or 46 hectares. The impervious areas in the master plan layout are approximately 35% less than what was previously estimated in the SMP, which equates to a reduction in total impervious area of approximately 19 hectares. This reduction in impervious area will significantly reduce the post-development peak flow estimates from the site, as well as reduce attenuation requirements and water treatment device footprints. This demonstrates the level of conservatism in the peak flow development stormwater modelling carried out as part of the SMP. Updating the runoff modelling and subsequent attenuation and treatment demand and footprints will be undertaken as the master plan is further refined through the planning and consenting process. In order to demonstrate the feasibility of the stormwater approach and ability to comply with the Nelson Tasman Land Development Manual, detention, re detention requirements, preliminary sizing and potential location of atten attenuation devices were identified in the SMP, which included both offline and online options. The purpose of this was to demonstrate that it is spatially feasible that stormwater detention can be provided within the PPC 28 area. The exact provision of online and offline detention will be determined as part of the future design and planning process as the master plan is further developed. Um, 
online, online attenuation typically provides higher storage volumes compared to offline, as they can better utilise natural topography. Online storage also typically requires more ecological and fish passage considerations. While there is a general preference for offline storage, as they typically have smaller footprints and less ecological considerations, online storage can sometimes be preferred given specific site constraints and opportunities such as road crossings. And I know we've already discussed, discussed quite a bit of that already. Um, water quality mitigation measures have been provided in, in the SMP to demonstrate that there is sufficient area available to accommodate these. The footprints shown in figure four of the SMP are based on either rain garden or wet, wetland options providing 100% of the treatment capacity. Therefore, not all of the footprints, footprints are required, but a combination of these areas will be utilised at suitable locations within the site. Um, I just wanted to clarify that because I had a discussion with Ms Purden on that yesterday and um, that may have not been very clear. Um, rain gardens are typically located close to source, which is a preference for stormwater treatment. Wetlands are generally relocated in low slope areas Therefore, wetlands within the PPC 28 area may be required to be located within riparian zones and open space or recreational zones. The final selection of treatment devices, layout and distribution will be determined as part of the future design and planning process as the master plan is further developed. While a detailed assessment of the effects of stormwater discharge from the PPC 28 on the Mai Tai River receiving environment has not been undertaken as, undertaken as part of the SMP. The current land use for the pasture areas of the lower Karka stream catchment primarily consists of grazing cattle with unfenced waterways. This type of farming leads to the runoff and leaching of nutrients into rivers, streams, estuaries and underground water. With livestock having direct access to waterways within the Karka stream catchment, they can pollute more directly and can add sediment through the breaking down and erosion of stream banks. With the removal of grazing and changing land use in these areas, together with proposed water sensitive design measures in the Karka stream catchment, I see this as being a real opportunity to actually increase the quality of water entering the Maitahi River. Mm -hmm. uh, the SMP was prepared at the request of various experts during the conferencing phase to provide a high-level document outlining proposed stormwater management processes. The SMP provides a set of stormwater management principles and objectives for PPC 28, outlining the site-specific site constraints and opportunities, and demonstrating how stormwater management-related relate, expectations under the Nelson Resource Management Plan and the Nelson Tasman Land Development Manual could be met. The SMP clearly demonstrates that the associated effects of the development within the site and the receiving environment can be appropriately managed and where possible enhanced as it changes from the current land use to a mixture of residential, recreational and commercial. I acknowledge that there is further work to do on the SMP during future stages of the planning and consenting process in conjunction with refinement of the master plan. Some of this future work will include guidance and framework regarding the integration of a stage development within a site-wide approach, and clear definition of the stormwater management requirements for the site based on future iterations of the master plan layout, and demonstration of how this will be achieved. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. We'll come to Gwen. Do we want to have... Yeah, David, do you want to say your opening statement? Yes, sure. Can you hear me? Yep. Very well, thank you. Great. Morena Tato, ko Damien Toko and and firstly, apologies if I'm sounding a bit blocked up, fighting off a cold, and apologies I can't be in the room today. Um, like like other experts, I've prepared <laughs> a, a statement of evidence, uh, a, a summary statement of evidence, um, and then happy to answer questions. Um, so my um, evidence is on the topic of um, off-site flood effects, um, flood hazard affecting adjacent and downstream properties, um, and my evidence is, um, covers that topic. 
I don't require any uh, corrections or adjustments to be made to those um, submitted statements. Uh, I was involved in the pre-hearing discussions, um, the conferencing discussions with Ms. Kate uh, Purton and Mr. Daly Selchik. Uh, I've read their statements of evidence. Uh, the majority of their evidence relates to on-site uh, management of stormwater, on-site flood risk, um, for example, the erosion risk within the carcass stream. Um, these, these matters are addressed um, for the applicant by the other experts, um, notably Mr. Morris Mills and um, Mr. Ferrant, who I've worked closely with. Um, the scope of my evidence is on potential offsite flood effects um, from PPC 28. And in my opinion, uh, matters relating to those potential offsite flood effects have been appropriately and adequately addressed through, uh, through that process. Um, so the two main causes of offsite flooding effects were, were discussed, that were discussed through conferencing. Um, A, the encroachment of earthworks onto the lower floodplain um, down where the Kaka confluences with the Maitai which um, the encroachment reduces the available floodplain storage there into the existing floodplain, and B, um, the change in runoff response from the plan change area in terms of increased total runoff volumes and potentially adverse changes in the timing of those peak runoffs uh, during flood events. Uh, the assessment of effects on offsite flooding due to, to both of those, um, the encroachment and the change in runoff response, um, we discussed in conferencing and additional information was provided as part of that process uh, in the form of a, a memo, additional flood hazard uh, letter. Uh, um, and those queries related to clarification of assumptions made for the, the post-development um, modelling scenarios. Um, that additional information included results from another scenario we ran in which the, uh, the combined effect of those of the fill encroachment with a a, hypothetically, uh, a hypothetical runoff hydrograph was, was modelled and, um, and the details of that are in the, the additional flood hazard um, letter. But essentially, uh, the, um, we, we synthesised a, a runoff hydrograph that was impossibly adverse in that um, there was more runoff than rainfall, um, just to see you know, in, 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 in that event what happens to downstream um, flooding and, and if it was demonstrated that um, there were no storage related flooding um, increases in the downstream floodplain, then regardless of what the, the final um, shape of the hydrograph or the timing of the hydrograph um, would be in any post-developed case, um, we would be confident that, um, that off-site effects would be low and, um, and that was found to be the case. So um, in terms of, in my opinion, the results clearly demonstrated that regardless of any increase in total runoff volume or change in the timing, the modelled off-site or downstream effects are negligible. Um, I understand from, from her evidence that in the opinion of Ms Purton, the applicant has not sufficiently demonstrated that the feasibility of attenuating post-developed um, peak flows to pre-developed levels as my analysis and modelling um, assumes. Um, that's addressed in the evidence of Mr Mills. And I also note that Mr Solchak has raised queries about the potential effects of uh, PC28 on the, on the surface water groundwater inf interface um, and on the assessment of post-developed runoff potential from those um, earthworked areas, especially any of those new field areas. And that's addressed in the evidence of Mr Foley. I'm pleased to answer any questions about my evidence. I just have one supplementary question, Damien. Um, um, Mr. Farrant uh, answered a question that uh, arose from Commissioner Ratt about uh, relative contributions to Q um, from Kaka and the Mai Tai, uh, and he gave a figure of 7%, which I think was 300 QMEX for, for the Mai Tai and 25 QMEX on a 1 in 100 year event. My question is, is that sort of relative percentage mimicked across a range of AEPs um, more f with greater frequency? That's a good question. Uh, yes, yes. So um, regardless of the AEP, the, um, the, the percentage contribution from Kaka will be about the same. Um, important to note that um, Kaka being a smaller catchment, two and a half square kilometres compared to the Mai Tais, <coughs> about 100 square kilometres, the, um, the critical storm for the Kaka catchment is a lot, a lot shorter, uh, something of the order of between sort of one to three hour um, storm will produce the, the highest flows in that, in that catchment. Um, whereas the, the Mai Tai 
the critical storm was more like a six hour or 12 hour event. Um, so um, if there was a, a real weather event that, uh, that lasted for six hours, we would see a, good, a, a big response in the Maitai catchment, but a, moderately, a, moderate, a more moderate response from the kaka and, and vice versa, a shorter event will produce a, a, a greater response in the kaka and, and a, a, um, a more subdued response from the overall Maitai, which has a bit more um, buffer in it to absorb those smaller, shorter events. Um, but uh, not all that to say, um, in, answer to your, in answer to your question, yes, there'll be some variability, but yes, generally, uh, over over a range of storm events, we'd expect those approximate um, proportions of thank, contribution. Thank from you Park for that. Maitai. Um, and just one other question: Could you just briefly characterise the flushing characteristics of the Maitai uh, based on your knowledge of the hydrographs, just to get a sense of um, how quickly uh, that works through the system? Yes, thank you. Yes, so um, the Mai Tai, um, there's been a little bit of work done in the Mai Tai in terms of understanding its gravel load, its base um, bed load. And um, as, as uh, Mr. Ferrant shared earlier, the, the average, I mean, the, the, the gravel the gravel loads do tend to come down in pulses associated with flood events, but the average annual load is around about 500 cubic metres per year. Um, and and we don't have data from the, the Kaka stream, but um, we would expect in a, in a storm event uh, that around the, the bends, around uh, Sunday Hole, Black Hole, Denny's Hole, um, the velocities in the, the flow velocities in the Maitai River, um, they vary obviously around bends and uh, uh, through the straits and the, the deep parts and shallow parts, but they range from sort of two to three metres per second up to five to six metres per second um, in extreme events. Um, and and those, those values are from a 100-year event. Um, and in those events, um, and with that gravel load, we'd expect to see quite, um, um, quite significant uh, movement of gravels and um, on the tail of the uh, the tail of the storm event, so the receding part of the hydrograph, we'd expect to see um, a lot of the um, smaller particles um, cleaned off and washed downstream um, um, relatively quickly. And um, if there were any, um, um, you know, if there's any, any deposition in the current situation um, uh, around any of those holes, that um, those would be cleaned off after um, during a storm event. Um, and and the the flows coming out of the, the you know the flows in this area um, in the Mai Tai up around the 400 cubic meters per second mark, compared with what's coming out of Kaka um, 30 cubic meters per second, the um, would expect to see you know, depending on what was going on in the catchments, expect to see um, a um, sort of a pro rata in terms of the um, sediment yield in, in the in the um, in the existing case. And, uh, and, and so um, there's a factor of sort of what, 10 to 1 in terms of the, the sediment and the mixing that goes on around that, that area. Thank you. Thank you to both witnesses. Um, we'll just go to questions. Can I, can I just lead off first? And it's, it's, a, it's a broader question. It might not be Mr Mills' best to answer. It might be um, Mr Lyle. I'm just thinking... Um, you made the, the the point and the obvious point that the stormwater management plan came out of expert conferencing and, and the suggestion through the 42A that there was insufficient information. And I was just thinking in terms of the whole application process, why it wasn't thought about whether the stormwater management plan and, and the master plan for that, um, <clears throat> and that the storm, uh, sorry, and that the um, master plan weren't produced right at the beginning as part of the whole framing of the of the process. It seems to me that what's happened is when we've gone through and looked at this and set up the conferencing and the council looked at it, they've said there's, there's deficiencies and you've agreed with that, but produced these things after the fact. And the question, and I think Mr Mills says it, you know, it's been, the stormwater management plan per se has been produced quickly and because they're normally very complex documents. So is there a rationale or reason why it wasn't kind of done at the initial stages? And, and if, I mean, we can't go back, but I'm just trying to get a context it sounds like we're almost like we're backfilling. Uh, 
Um, I guess um, from my perspective, um, first of all, um, a lot of the information that was used to put together the stormwater management plan was already available and had been um, gathered, I guess, in preparation of the wider plan change and the technical reports that um, we submitted with the application uh, for plan change. So um, to, that, to that extent, yes, it, it did have to come together quickly, but it was using information that we already had that was, was informing our assessments. Um, the um, the non-provision of a stormwater management plan, I suppose, was um, in part at least, uh, from my experience in Nelson, having seen a number of the urban growth plan changes come forward um, with schedules um, in the Stoke Valleys where there wasn't a need for a stormwater oh, okay. management plan. So um, I guess the world's obviously moved on um, since um, that um, experience and um, so we, we obviously jumped in and, and, and did that work. In terms of the um, master plan, um, I guess again, um, from my perspective, and um, speaking on behalf of our uh, of our multidisciplinary team, um, there was actually um, numerous versions of the structure plan and a very early master plan prepared well before the plan change request was submitted. Um, but it was very much a guess, um, and. We um, didn't think it would be um, needed for the for the plan change request. Um, and again, when we uh, went through the conferencing process, and I think that was through the urban design conferencing that they decided that would be really helpful to them, we doubled back on what we had already done um, through Rough and Mill in particular, um, and um, um, used picked up what we had already had um, in hand right from the start, I mean, going back 18 months probably at least, um, and, and updated that with the, with the latest structure plan. So um, in hindsight, yes, um, we should have. Um, but well, that's fine. I mean, it was, just, that, it was just context, so that's useful, because, yeah. um, you know, to use that hackneyed phrase, we are where we are. So um, that's useful context. So um, I'll hand over to the other. I suppose we'll pick up, and this is the whole thing, we'll, we'll pick up with um, Mr Lyle. It's the state, the status of the stormwater management plan, um, because the stormwater management plan is not, as I understand, well, the stormwater management plan that's being produced at the moment does not form part of the plan change, as I understand it. It's clearly information which is, is aimed to support it and to convince us that there's an appropriate methodology to address stormwater and other issues, but the way that Mr Lyle has cast the plan change, there will be stormwater management plans that will be required through the resource consent process, which I want to question that with Mr Lyle when we come to it. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I just wanted to mention two things. One, in response to your question, there was some anxiety too that in producing information like the master plan that it would actually become the sort point of what? critique. Uh, and so it had a sort of shadow edge to it. Mm -hmm. um, and as Mr Lyle said, we actually did have the background information, so it was actually not done in a hurry in the sense that there, was, there wasn't the work that sat behind it. It was just a question of producing it because that was what the experts decided. On the stormwater management plan, there are two ways to skin that cat. The first is to incorporate what's there with refinements and an acknowledgement of further information by reference, mm. uh, or alternatively, simply the current scheme, which is to require one, um, refine the words about what it needs to do, um, and acknowledge that the current SMP is a resource that will be available to the council and built upon in due course, but it's not strictly part of the plan change. Right. So those are the two yeah, it is. options. Thank you for that. That's very helpful, because it's, it's a, in terms of that second option, really, really about um, and why we're exploring this issue about what are the appropriate outcomes that you might want to achieve which might need to go into the stormwater yeah. management plan or the other plan, hence, hence our sort of focus on some of the words that Mr yeah. Mark Brown has been... And we're aligned yeah. to that. Yeah, great. <laughs> Thank you. My first question is for Mr Velu Pillay, seeing that he's spoken most recently. Thank you for that presentation on the flooding. 
So if we go to the um, draft stormwater. Can you hold that down for me? The draft stormwater management plan. Are you familiar with that? Are you yes, familiar I am. with the yes. draft? Yeah. Yes. So it has a. Um, The guts of it, if you like, is the Table 5.1, which is the regulatory and design requirements. And under flooding, it's got... Um, it's working. <laughs> under water quantity, so this is page... Have you got, the, have you got it there? Perhaps you... I, ha I have. I'm trying to find the page. Page 27. So under, under water quantity, which is really flooding, um, the, the minimum standard was to provide detention so that post-development peak flows shall not exceed pre-development for the various AEPs. So my understanding is that what you are saying is that when the applicant or someone designing a subdivision or an area of development within that whole catchment comes along, they, they need to provide detention to detention for that area by some detention device and that's a fairly straightforward calculation to do. So you're just providing it for that area and then if you do that for all the areas that are developed then at the bottom you, you, you end up with a, uh, a post-development hydrograph which is not causing any increase in flooding. Is that is that that's what you're correct. saying? That's correct. Yeah. Yes, that's what I'm saying. And you don't and you don't need your evidence is you don't need any more controls um, because of timing and things. It's just it's just done for each of those subcatchments as a fairly straightforward engineering exercise of uh, flood routing through a device. Um, I would I would say that at the subdivision consenting stage there would be um, there would usually be a, once the lot layouts and, and um, lo uh, locations of any devices are um, finalised, um, that it would be prudent to to run the model again just to check that um, that that assumptions made during. So, uh, which that. model is that for the whole area? Uh, the flood model you're using to uh, to assess offsite effects. Yeah. So if yeah. you, it, so, yeah, this is, I guess, what I'm getting at. So there's not much direction about in the catchment management plan about that. So we've got this table which says that. So when, when you're coming to a resource consent and the engineers are looking at that, how are they going to know that that's what's required? And I'm just wondering, I don't expect you to ask that now, answer that now, but I think this, if you were listening before, it's, I think it's part of further work that's needed to, to give direction or some out some outcome, so we, you know you get you're getting what you want. Because I'm I'm well aware that you need to be careful with with doing this. That you're not you know if you're doing well, you've got to be careful with with that detention in terms of areas and make sure you're getting your right outcome. So we're looking at the outcome, and then the direction that's required through the catchment management plan to get that outcome. Not telling you how to do it. And I understand that. Not saying where the devices have to be, but you know, the engineering aspects of the outcome. So can you, uh, sure. so do you think that that sounds like something that's needed to be put into the catchment management plan? That's probably my question. Um, yes, okay, Poss uh, possibly. I, I'll just comment by saying that, um, the, so uh, I, I, I do a lot of work through with Tonkin and Taylor for the um, Nelson City Council. And uh, when we're doing our city, flood hazard mapping, uh, you know, um, you've got the choice of whether you just look at existing development across, you know, a catchment or a floodplain, or you look at a maximum probable development. And the approach taken, taken by Nelson City Council is to just look at existing development because um, they know that they can rely on consenting processes um, to require any development upstream of, um, of built environment to um, provide attenuation, hydraulic neutrality, and um, and so the, the provisions for that are firstly to limit your peak flows, obviously, um, but secondly to um, to provide some mitigation of the you can you can limit peak flows, but you've you've got an, an increase in total runoff volume and an, and an increased frequency of short duration 
um, more frequent events. So those are um, those are dealt with through extended detention. So I guess the um, the Nelson City Council, you know, in terms of their flood protection modelling, they take a view that the provisions in their land development manual are sufficient to, um, to, 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 to deal with those effects. Um, and if any subdivision came along, they would have to do their, their own assessment of effect on that. I think where, where the PC28 has an advantage is that we've already done um, some modelling here that even if that shows that even if we um, you know, put a, turn the tap on in Kaka unreasonably high so that there's just water sort of pouring out of that catchment um, more than is falling onto it in terms of rainfall, that um, the downstream floodplain um, in that 1% event that we've looked at, um, that there are no um, storage related flooding issues. So that, in other words, that the, all that flow from that catchment can be conveyed through. So there isn't a conceivable um, configuration of um, you know, outflow hydrograph that could conceivably now um, lead to more than negligible kind of offsite flooding. So, um, I think what you're saying is right that it's um, it's it, in a normal um, process you would have a, a subdivision consent that would need to assess offsite effects and, uh, for that consent, and that would be, that would be appropriate. Um, I would say in this case we've 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 done that through this um, hypothetical storm scenario. Okay, and then and going, going back to this catchment management table, it does refer back to the Nelson Tasman Land Development Manual. So that that's sort of going to be sufficient in your view to, to, to get all that? Yeah. In my view, yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, sorry, is it on all the time? <laughs> okay. I need to push it. Okay. So, Mr. Mr. Mills, um, I've printed out the catchment management plan, and I want to go through it in some detail because I know it is a, a high order. But in terms of, I guess, me being satisfied, it's addressing it and trying to work through. Is it going to give the outcomes? Is this just a number of matters I'd just like to discuss? So, do you have a copy of it there? Yes, I do. Um, I have version V2. Is it the same one as what you've got? Sorry? The, the, the copy I have is version 2, because you referred to a draft. Ver, version 2. Yes. yes. OK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, version 2. Yeah. So, I mean, I, my first comment, I think the, uh, it's, it's all that the first front end is, is very good, very comprehensive. And then when we get it, when we actually, the, the problems that I've got, or perhaps some of the gaps or the, the work that's needed, that I, I see is when we're coming into the, um, the actual nitty gritty. And I think that just reflects that um, it's a difficult thing to do. We're talking with Mr. Farrant. I mean, I've, I've worked in this area a long time. Stormwater management's not easy because you've got all these different uh, factors. Um, and it's not easy to write a, a stormwater management plan that's going to cover every eventuality. So my first one is table 5.1, first comment. Um, page 25, under water quality, and it's got the first under the proposed approach, that column, eliminate contaminants through the use of inert building materials where feasible. So my question would be, why have where feasible, and is there not an intention that all buildings do avoid copper and zinc, bare copper and zinc, because that's sort of well established good practice to do so. so Oh, that's a fair comment. Um, I believe that in my evidence we've actually volunteered to do that. So. So. Yeah, well that's right. And, and, um, and I guess another point is, is that something that could be an X9, you know, as something like, this is going to happen and it's just done. Because I mean, going back to the Auckland experience, you've got the similar receiving environments with estuaries and things where you're worried about, you know, copper and zinc accumulating. So. That sort of seems to be good practice now. I don't know whether Mr. Farrant like to. Perhaps you could comment on that too. No, I mean, yeah, I think you're right in terms of it is it is common best practice. Although I would just note that I've just sent an email to the New Zealand Institute of Architects for awarding two awards: one for a copper building and one for a, um, a galvanised zinc building. Sorry, I just missed that about what you sent to the NZAA. Oh, just in their recent awards, they've awarded top awards um, to one a house which is oh, no. entirely in galvanised yeah. iron and 
Yes, no, I, 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 I'm well aware of that, and I can um, perhaps <laughs> give you some solace that my wife's an architect, so I do try and lobby through, through that. Good. So, no, I'm very much aware of that issue, and I certainly was involved in that, well, probably 20 years ago now in Auckland, um, you know, with, with that issue. Yeah. Um, but, but, but I think just, just in, in a more serious note, um, yeah, it's very uncommon to see um, roofing materials now that aren't inert, and particularly yeah. in these sort of developments, but there are still other... other yeah, but again, it's like, yeah. and it's this, I guess, perhaps with a... Yeah, so, I mean, I would see that we need another iteration of the plan where perhaps feasible is taken out of it. Would you, you, you would um, see that that would be reasonable? Yeah, for that, for sure. Yeah, yep. okay. Um, and the second um, question is on that same column, and the next point again, um, where FISA will provide retention of at least five millimetres of runoff depth. Um, so the feasibility, perhaps Mr. Ferrant or, or um, Mr. Mills, what's the fees? Can you just explain the feasibility then? Yeah, actually, um, Mr. Foley covers that off on his evidence. I don't know whether um, he'd like to address that now or later on. Okay, no. So that's well, that's the answer. So it's where you can get that infiltration. Okay. Perhaps it's just worth explaining that, you know, because again, you've got to wear feasible. Yep. What you know, when you, someone's looking at it, what does that actually mean? What aspect of feasibility? So again, it's just perhaps tidying up on that. Yep. And then in the next column over, um, I, I probably am getting a bit pedantic, but you've got reference, and you've got three, four, five, six. What what are those numbers refer to? Or is that a typo? Because I couldn't see any references listed. Is that, is there, are there references um, listed at the end here? Maybe I missed it. Yeah, I believe that's a typo. The only, only reference there should be to the NTLDM. Yep. So. Okay, I just don't want to be pedantic, but I thought maybe there were some references left off, so that's the reason yep. for that question. Um, And under the water, so we keep in that same table, if you go down under roads, hard stand and driveways, um, then we had a, we had a, um, under the proposed approach, we had a number seven there. Is that, what that what's that number for? Does that, is that a typo or? Does oh, that should just be a bullet point, sorry. A bullet point. Yeah. So isolation of hazardous substances using pre-treatment devices. Um, So that's, can you perhaps just explain? Oh, actually, sorry, that shouldn't be a bullet point. There should just be no number at all there, so. So yeah, well that's, is, is it a heading and then underneath this grated catch pits and gross pollutant traps? Is correct, that, correct, yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, that, I mean, you use grated catch pits and, oh, I see, so you've got gross pollutant traps. So that's how you deal with that, okay. Um, and I noticed on that next column over in reference, and there were a lot of reference to the NTLDM, um, but it seemed to me that there were quite a few references to the NTLDM that, shouldn't, that should be that weren't. So 5.4.12, 5.4.8, don't want to go through that, and, but good practice enhanced water quality. So I think that, that needs fishing out again. Okay. Okay. We go over to the next page. Yes, this whole thing about the, the, the infiltration, I do, I do understand that. Um, and, and you've got these extra recharge zones, but you are talking about in the lower area, trying to manufacture, if you like, a recharge zone by that fill, right? Correct. So I understand that. I guess it's, um, I don't know that it's coming through sort of clearly enough, you know? That when when it comes to be that maybe it maybe it does, but I it, so when when that work's done in that area, there's going to be care taken to get granular fill to do the filling so that you can rely on that infiltration, right? That's correct. Yeah. Yes. So um, that's not in in the provisions in X, and I'm not sure that it's clear clearly set out. 
If you could perhaps lead, show me where that's, that's clearly set out in the catchment management plan. Uh, I don't believe it is clearly set out in the catchment management plan. It was probably a piece of work that we did after this was issued. Well, that, yeah, and I think you know that's an example. It's a, it's a moving document, yep. but but you would agree that's important to have that in there. Yes, I do. Yeah, yeah, yes. cool. Okay. Okay, so flooding's good. If we move over. Well, a fairly minor point. Page 28, the table there, under conveyance, down the bottom. It's saying ensuring infrastructure is kept above the 1% flood. I mean, infrastructure is a very general term. What sort of infrastructure? Roads? That's, that just needs clarification. You're not putting your pipes above it, so again, pedantic, but you know. <laughs> yep. Yes, yeah, so and if we come across just on this inert, so uh, table 5.2, page 30, address the stormwater effects, and you've got application generation of. Oh, it says here again, generation of contaminants will be prevented as far as possible through the use of inert building materials. So, I mean, you can read that both ways. So, are you going to use inert materials? It could read it. So, again, maybe firming up that inert materials will be used. Yeah. Okay, going over to page 32, 5.5, water quality. Second bullet point. Implement where possible water sensitive design approach. I thought it, it is a water sensitive design approach. I thought that's what you said you're doing. And the word where possible to me is, is not helpful, and, and I would suggest it shouldn't be there. Can you comment on that? Uh, well, I guess we don't propose to um, implement water sensitive design approaches throughout the whole site. Um, where, for, where, for example, where, where will you not be doing it? Um, in the Bayview, and, sorry, in the okay, Walters yeah, yeah, Bluff okay. and Brooklyn's catchment. So. All right. Um, well, I'm going to wonder if that again needs clarification. So in the Karka Valley, you will be doing it, but not elsewhere. So again, is that because it's quite a distinction? Yep. I understand that, but I think it's my, it, that needs to be clarified. And then 5.5.1, it's got residential buildings, it says using inert materials. So again, there's this inconsistency. Of, I mean, I think that's probably fine. You are going to use them. 5.5.2, roads, car parks, hard stands. Where feasible, include near to source using swales, rain gardens, tree pits and permeable pavements. I'll put a note here. Can more guidance be needed? You know, how do you how do you work out where feasible? Is this due to slope, or you know, what would be the criteria there? Are you saying that if you if you swales you need a minimum slope for, rain gardens you need area? I don't know. Maybe uh, maybe maybe that needs a bit more thought. And just clarification, at the top of page 33, talking about stormwater treatment, third line, um, treating the first flush, I think you need some, something like from contaminated generating surfaces or something like that. Just to, you don't want to be treating the first flush from everything. So again, it's probably pretty obvious, but maybe just a clarification there. Coming down to 5.5.4 on page 33, receiving environment. And here you talk about a different treatment strategy will be adopted for the discharge of the stream compared with the pipe network Walters Bluffs. Um, but it doesn't say what that difference is. It sort of then says, well, I, don't, I, just, yeah, I just wonder, it needs a bit more thought there about what that difference is, maybe summarising that a bit better. Uh, again, that was covered off in some of my um, evidence, yeah. but I agree it should, it should sure. probably yeah. appropriate. And I, and I, you know, it's just, yeah. 
just an example of a, of a work in progress. But so, so this is not a criticism. I think it's just saying well, this is you know this is where we've got to. And I realise that you know this is now month a month old, and it's a fast moving thing. Now a, a point that I have to 5.5.5 section on page 33. That's under water quality heading and it shouldn't. It's not, not under water quality. So again, that would be confusing for someone who's new to it looking at, you know, looking at the thing. So that needs to be a separate, needs to be 5.6 or something. Again, somewhat pedantic, but I think they're up, they are. Um, stormwater is, is, is technically difficult to people who know about it and then to other people it's even more difficult. So it's like just being as clear as possible with the wording does that make sense? Yep. Okay, over to page 34. In that um, third bullet point there, to meet hydrological mitigation objectives, consideration of the following management options, where feasible drillings do include rainwater capture. So again, what some guidance on what the feasibility is. Can you perhaps explain to us now what you would see, you know, what, what's, what's associated with feasibility of doing that? Well, I guess that um, there's more potential to be able to do that in a lower density area rather than a higher density area. So we've got very high density sections, you may not have the room to do that. So, okay. um, so in terms of giving advice to someone for the resource consent stage, do you think it would be useful to Perhaps elaborate on that in this section. Mm -hmm. Yep. You've got a typo, sorry, just before 5.5.6, got a pretty classic typo there, deceives rather than devices. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so spell check wouldn't wouldn't check that up. Wouldn't pick that up. And you're coming on to um, page 39, figure 5.1. It's got a number of catchments there, but the numbers aren't on them, so it was a little bit hard to, well, I probably figured it out, but maybe in the next iteration have the, have the catchment numbers there, because then you refer to the catchments in the table below. And also immediately above table 5.5 in that paragraph, it refers to a one hour 100% AEP. That should presumably be 1%. Yep. Correct. Again, pedantry to the fore. Going over to page 41, 5.6.2.4, first bullet point middle of that talking about planting strips for detention devices. Is that useful having that in there? Perhaps go back to Mr. Farrant's likelihood of planting strips providing detention in this catchment, do you think? I mean, realistically, it's, it's probably going to be minimal compared to other devices, but I think it's still... Okay you know, to have it in. It, there's, there's still merit at a, a yep. catchment-wide okay. modelling okay. project. So going over to page 42, 5.6.3, erosion risk management. In the second paragraph, the scale and severity of this requires detailed geomorphological assessment as part of subdivision and engineering plan design. And that'll be in the resource consent. So, Again, doesn't seem to be guidance about you know what what's what's that to be. Perhaps you can tell me, perhaps Mr. Farrant. Yeah, I mean, I would I would raise the complexity with that um, when you're talking about erosion risk um, from small rainfall events. We're talking about 
you know, low flows. We're not, yeah. you know, and, no, and... I understand that. Yeah, yeah I, I struggle to see many places across New Zealand where they've actually fully cracked that on the head and, and you know, through well, the... Well, exactly, and, and, and just by way it might be useful that in the recent um, work at Drury, um, three rather, rather large greenfield subdivisions there, that, that was not done. It was, you do your hydrological mitigation. So I guess I question it. I perhaps question it, is, it, is that needed? So I'm perhaps I'm going rather than saying more, maybe, maybe that's not needed now. I guess I'm, I need yeah. to be careful not to give yeah, look, te I'll... technical evidence, but I'll go, perhaps go back to you. And I would suggest that if you're doing hydrological mitigation as you're proposing, Do you think it's getting... there's not much point looking at that individual stream geomorphology because it's going to be completely modified anyway. Um, I think there's two points there. The, the upper reach won't be completely modified um, in terms of the stream won't be yep, mod okay. modified. Yep. But I tend to agree with you in terms of the ability to do accurate hydrological modelling at that, at that really low frequent level. Um, a lot of that came out of the conferencing and, and yeah. some of the requests from the, from the, um, from the experts. Okay. But my, my personal, well, well, professional opinion is that you're better off focusing on water balances <coughs> and, and volumes to try and match a pre-development. Okay, so what would be your recommendation in terms of a catchment management plan Addressing that, would you? Can you think about that for yep, the next? Yep, I can think about that. And yep. you will be pleased to know, as will my panel members. That is it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, we have questions. Thank you. So, yeah. right. I don't think I have any other questions that, um, either. I think. I think. We'll, well, let me just check. Mr. Parsons said we don't have questions for Mr. Parsons. Related? Nothing related? No, thank you for that. Um, I don't have any further questions. I think, um, again, it was sort of an exercise, as I said, that the stormwater management plan is not part of the plan change per se, but I think what we're really trying to explore, you know, in Section 32 terms is, you know, is there an appropriate solution? And I think, I think, um, I'm not saying there's not, I'm just saying, you know, there is still information gaps which, which we're, we're attempting to fill and hopefully get some confidence that, that um, clearly there are appropriate outcomes that can be achieved. And of course the council officers will, will cover that off in their response uh, next week. Okay. So thank you very much. Um, okay. well, if there's any uh, um, questions uh, of the experts in terms of appropriate solutions, then our assumption is you've addressed them now and we'll, we'll go away and think about that. And and hence, I think why it was sort of reasonably, sort of comfortable, reasonably detailed questionings of of um, of Mr. Mark Brown at that level, and I, I think we'll probably end up in a similar kind of discussion with Mr. Lyle mm. in terms of the way that the plan provisions are put together, and again, re really, I think trying to understand how it all works. Not saying it's not all there; it's just that I, I think at this stage we're still a bit, well, I am anyway, at least a bit unclear on how it all hangs together, and Mr. Lyle may well be have very clear answers for us. Thanks. Uh, Yeah, so we're going to call Mark Foley now. Yeah, so we're, yeah, we're not going to do that. Um, so in my schedule, Mr Foley isn't shown, but he is a witness for us. He's the geotech. We can do it after lunch, or we can Well, let's do it now, because we didn't... Because we, he's got us... He's, he's put in some rebuttal to... Yeah. Um, to save the Mai Tai, and I think we didn't, we might have, didn't just see if we've got any questions of him, so let's, let's yeah. call him now before lunch. All right. Will you help him with that machine? You can stay there. <coughs> Mark, do you want to come Yeah. 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 Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, may I just first make a comment? Um, 
technological issues. I have hearing aids and they are not working too well. Right. And I've got a bit of a sinus blockage. So I might have to ask you to repeat any questions once or twice just to be able to hear you. Okay? That's fine. Right. Um, <clears throat> yeah, my name is Mark Foley. Um, and I've undertaken the geotechnical assessments for the plan change application. Um, my evidence in chief was presented. Um, and I don't need to make any changes to that. I will just briefly summarise that um, in my evidence I confirmed that Mr Hurry, the council's expert, and I were in agreement that there are no significant constraints that would make the land unsuitable for rezoning and that we identified that the existing provisions in the plan and the RMA um, were adequate to assess geotechnical risks um, at the resource consent stage um, for any resource consent application. <coughs> Subsequently, um, I prepared rebuttal evidence. Um, this was in response to addendum evidence by Mr Sujik, and I'll just go through the key points of that summary evidence um, now. When I complete that, there are um, four points that were raised yesterday um, that were relevant to me and I just want to address those, and there was a further point of questioning just before with Mr Mills that I'll also briefly touch base on. So in my rebuttal evidence, I confirm that geohydrology and material permeability have been considered as part of the assessments to support the proposed plan change. The floodplain soils consist of moderate permeability silt and sand overlying high permeability gravel. <coughs> Due to the permeable nature of the gravel and anisotropic permeability characteristics, which, which I mean is that water can flow horizontally quite quickly, but not necessarily vertically um, as quickly, um, the groundwater gradient is quite flat in the floodplain area. And the groundwater within the floodplain area is most significantly influenced by the groundwater levels at the downstream end, which are dictated by the Matahi River level. So when the Matahi is in flood and the Kaka is in flood, the primary contribution is the, is the Matahi River levels lift the groundwater table, and that has an influence on the overall groundwater in that floodplain area. Now, the nature of the engineered fill which would be placed over a portion of the floodplain um, for residential development would impact on direct infiltration rates into the, into, um, the filled portion of the floodplain. Now fill specifications for that fill material can be developed to allow, to allow water sensitive design to be incorporated successfully into that development. Within the plan change area there is a large range of fill sources available for use in earthworks construction. These include alluvial gravels, the, such as exist in the floodplain and in some of the lower terraces inside the floodplain, and they will have a permeability similar to the underlying gravel. We can also utilise tighter, more cohesive soils that may reduce direct infiltration in areas where that may be required. And then there is a high permeability rock fill can be sourced within the area. And this can be used to aid infiltration and treatment of part of water sensitive design and allow direct infiltration through the fill at a similar or greater rate that can occur through the existing topsoil. The engineering parameters of the fill can be designed to achieve desired positive water sensitive design outcomes. Now I'm happy to answer questions on, on that. I'll just Firstly, just if you wish, I'll just address some of the points that were raised yesterday, four points from yesterday. Sure. The first um, relates to the geology and the soils at the site, and, and I um, answered a, 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 uh, <coughs> a question from Mr Brown yesterday on that. It was also brought up in discussions regarding... Uh, regarding um, earthworks and treatment of silt generation. First thing I want to compare, there was a lot of discussion about um, experience from Auckland um, and also perhaps some experience in Nelson and some citing some examples from the Bayview subdivision. And there was also the matter raised of um, 
Mr Ridley raised the, another plan change, and I can't quite remember the name of that elsewhere. I, I just want to confirm that the soils and the site characteristics we're dealing with here are Karka Valley soils and rock. They're not Auckland soils. They're not representative of the soils that may be found elsewhere in Nelson or elsewhere. They need to be considered in that, in that view. Um, the, rock, the hillside slopes um, are hard, strong rocks, and they are overlain by a thin veneer of soil, which generally is derived from the weathering of that rock. And it is a coarse soil, primarily, not a fine soil. Not a dominantly clay silt soil. There's a lot of gravel and sand in it. There will be finer soils in the lower floodplain. They cap the floodplain. That's an area of very low slope, and that's a different, different consideration when you're considering um, sediment generation and, and mitigation of that. And I do believe that when you consider the, the fact that the cuts and the fills in the rock terrain will be predominantly in rock material, mm -hmm. not in soil material, that the principles of the universal soil loss equation, which is often referred to in erosion control, may be limited in how they can assess the performance of that. We, we have seen that in the, in, the, um, in the Bayview subdivision. As an example, there are three primary soil rock types we deal with. Um, the two of them are more erodible type fine soils, and they create, they create particular issues. When we're dealing with the rock that's been excavated, we find that um, from earthworks, it's used, it is used to cap material to stop infiltration, if not, sorry, not to stop infiltration, but to seal up and seal the areas so that it doesn't generate silt in the fill areas, and in the cut areas it, does, it doesn't generate silt as well. So we get very good performance from the work in the rock terrain, and we have more manageable issues to do, deal with in the soil terrain. Um, second point, um, I'd just like to cover, was I heard the figure mentioned of 150 hectares of earthworks um, been undertaken because that was the plan change application for the residential. That, that, that is not the case and, and the estimates or the revised, the revised structure plan has pulled back the area that is going to be zoned for um, residential land. And that my, my estimate at the moment on the revised structure plan is that about 90 hectares has been identified um, out of the 267 of the plan change area as suitable for um, suitable or potentially suitable for the residential development to be zoned for that. And of that, um, I've identified that about 59 hectares has been identified on the indicative master plan for residential lots. So the actual areas that we're talking about are much less than perhaps might have been talking about earlier during conferencing with, with between parties. Sorry, can I, can I just um, ask you to clarify that? So the 90 hectares, what does that refer to? The, the, when I look at the structure plan, yep. I think by memory it's approximately 267 hectares of land yep. covered. <clears throat> Nine, approximately 90 hectares is identified in the area zoned for residential development. Yep. And the remaining is the balanced land which will go into yep. um, trees, etc., and yep. into the green spaces. Yeah, and then there was another one, 65 or something. When I looked at the <coughs> indicative master plan and recognising it as an indicative master plan, the areas shown for residential lots was approximately 59 hectares of that. So there was still quite a lot of green space shown in the areas for residential lots as well. Okay, thanks. <coughs> okay. Um, now, and, I, and as part of the process, I, I actually did a review of adjacent subdivisions on the Melvin Hills and, and did note that the physical constraints of geology and topography means that once you get into the steeper terrain, the yield of lots reduces considerably. And so, in some respects, the, the, um, the indicative master plan, it, it is still perhaps at an aspirational stage, I would say, and, and the real test will come when we look at the instability areas and we may want to reduce some of those areas as well or we may decide that <laughs> it is feasible to develop. So there's, there's still quite a lot of work to be done to get to a point where we you know, but it, it won't be more than what's shown. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. 
And, and I just want to point out that that was actually the, the fundamental um, agreement between Mr. Horry and myself and our primary, both our primary um, evidence is, is that the area is suitable, some areas may not be quite as suitable as other, and that will be developed throughout resource consent. The third point um, <clears throat> that I picked up on yesterday was there was some discussion about earthworks and what might be permitted and could potentially get in under a resource consent threshold for, for, for being done. Um, Now, my understanding, development on the floodplain area in the lower slopes, um, which is perhaps 50% of the lots, um, the indications from, from um, Mr Pollock is that the development will essentially form the platforms in those areas, and there's very little need for earthworks afterwards, particularly on the floodplain area. They will be formed as flat land. Um, it, when we get to the steeper slides, that there may not be, it may not be appropriate to completely form flat slopes, and, and as is experience on the slopes at Baby Subdivision, sometimes they're graded at a one and six type slope, or about that. So there is a potential for some localised earthworks to be carried out on those on those lots. Mr. Lyle may be able to provide further clarification. The Nelson Resource Management Plan has a, has a threshold of 1.2 metres, depth of excavation triggers a resource consent. So we're, we're then looking at, we have a small proportion of lots over the whole development, may require some earthworks. In my experience, those earthworks to put in perhaps a, a basement excavation for a gauge will be more than 1.2 metres and they will trigger a resource consent. There may be some lots that may fall in between and have a small amount. But so, sorry, on that trigger, it's, what is it, 1.2 metres? 1.2 metres of earthworks One triggers... Depth. Depth of earthworks, correct. So it's not, not an area? Cut. OK. Cut will fill. No, OK. No. okay. Um, so there may be situations where some minor earthworks could be undertaken on a building site um, and under existing rules would not require resource consent. Um, in the context that I've considered this, currently, and for the last hundred years, the land use in the Kaka Valley of farming has allowed land disturbance activities as a matter of right, ploughing, um, clearing of trees, and even recently weed control, which has all exposed subsoils, and, and has a potential, um, particularly when you plough paddocks, to generate silt. Um, when we re relate that to the context of a, a small proportion that would have a, s a small proportion of lots with a small proportion of earthworks that could be undertaken, um, we're talking about a potential of perhaps four hectares of land could be developed with people doing earthworks in that time frame. But it would only be open for the period of clearing foundations and then it would be covered. So it would be a very small time interval. And when we view when we view the risks of associated with land development and on a risk-based approach, if time interval is very small, the exposure to extreme events that could cause problems um, reduces the risk to be to be over low level. Okay, we have a, so we have a, a significant reduction with the plan change in terms of the land that could be disturbed, could generate silt, and only some very small areas proportion within that that could actually be disturbed under existing rules. Um, I also note that it is, it is a practice in Nelson, and, and it's one that I've been fully involved in for the last 25 years, is that after the resource consent is issued and land is developed, th there has to be a statement of suitability for development signed off by the geotechnical professional on that land, and inevitably, um, for a lot of the work we do <laughs> in Tonkin, that's me. Um, we will incorporate recommendations for development of the lots for safe, stability-free and erosion-free development of that land. That may or may not be included in consent notices, which then go onto the title. And we will typically, on land that we consider to be sensitive, we will put further restrictions on what we think is appropriate than perhaps the 1.2 metre um, thing. So there are provisions for controlling um, how land is developed beyond the plan change through the resource consent and through the 
output of the res of consent process. So just, just clarifying, that's your, that's your sign off after the bulk earthworks have been done? That's right. It, it, is, it, is, it, is, it is standard practice that the, the, the sign off will, will provide the conditions and context in which that sign off is provided. And that will create maybe in discussions with council, whether it are, depending on the answer, may be included as consent notices on title. And that is often a requirement of the resource consent process. Okay. Moving on, the fourth point from yesterday was there was a little bit of discussion about sediment discharge during rain that might exceed um, detention pond capacity. And it was with, in the context that I heard it, it was re in, in relation to Denny's Hole, which is viewed as perhaps the place where this might go to, any, any silt generated and not being captured by a sediment detention device. Um, I'd just like to point out, I've, I've actually assessed Denny's Hole on a number of occasions over the last 25 years and including the stretch of the Maitai River. Um, I've noted it at low flows and I've noted it following significant flood events during that period of time. Um, I have been engaged by the Nelson City Council to design erosion protection measures on the Maitai River in very similar um, situations as we have here. Now, firstly, um, Mr. Valupalai noted that we're talking about velocities in the Maitai River in the order of two to perhaps five or six metres per second. So this is something like 20 kilometres an hour of, of water moving down, a body of water moving down the river. When it hits Denny's Hole, it hits a 90 degree bend. And that it, down slope side of that bend, it's, it's solid rock. It doesn't give way to the river. So the river velocity, the river has to go around the bend and it has to change velocity to go around. The inside will slow down a little bit and the outside has to speed up a bit to get that volume of water through. And as Mr. Volupolo mentioned, um, it has a, a significant flushing effect on the, on the bed load and the sus suspended sediment in the river. And, and so what, what we notice is that it is continually being flushed. The, um, the bed load that remains in the, in the bed of the river at Denny's Hole is a fine gravel on the very inside, or medium gravel on the very inside of the bend, and it progressively becomes a coarser gravel out into the centre of the hole, and then it is just rock, because no gravel that's carried by the river can actually stay there during the flood. So it has extremely efficient um, natural flushing ability at that point. Um, Mr Farrant mentioned the silt volume in the Maitai River, um, which is a considerable considerable volume. There are no figures on, on the carker, but on the, on the assessment of the proportion of the carker to the Maitai in terms of total flood flows, we are talking about an order of magnitude of different of, difference of flows essentially, um, and that the, the Maitai is the considerable influencer on what happens at Denny's Hole and not what will carry on, happen from the carker. Right, and I just mentioned today there was there was discussion. I haven't got a copy of the table in front of me, but you asked Mr. Mills about the infiltration where feasible. Um, now, the the feasibility for um, infiltration is is set out in the um, Nelson Land Development Manual, and and factors to consider are the permeability at a particular site, um, the groundwater level at the site, and slope stability at, at the site. So, in effect, what Mr. Mills is saying, we're feasible, and I would have probably influenced that, that in, uh, be, or taken, I certainly was part of the team putting it together, the report, but the, the site, the broader site of the plan change is very large in terms of, and it does include materials of varying nature, varying permeability. Um, on the western front, the Adafi Hills, there are some notable, um, recent landslides and, and for example so we would not consider it would be feasible to try to inject water into the head of a landslide. There are some certain locations around the apron of the um, slopes, the, this is where the steeper slopes then merge into the flatter slopes, you get an apron, where we see that where we see that particularly in spring and winter months we tend to get a bit of emergence of perched groundwater which is flowing through the soil it changes its gradient from a steep slope to a flat slope and it comes to the surface locally. We wouldn't look to be putting rain gardens in those areas. Um, 
And um, so, so just to summarise that, though, the, there are areas on the site which are naturally suitable. There are areas on the site, and discussions I've had with Ms. Farrant, uh, able to be engineered to be suitable. That is, that is what we do if we look at the permeability, if it's just a permeability contrast, we can manage that with the fill materials that are being placed. We can, we can increase the permeability locally of the rock. And it comes back to the site-specific assessment of infiltration from that to how much, how much you do. So it's a, the infiltration and the rainwater sensitive process is a site-specific assessment across it. And to be broad brush at this stage would, would, would give an, a false indication of what can be done. No, I understand that completely. I guess my issue is um, are the provisions in the X9 or whatever or in the catchment management plan sufficient at this stage to give guidance when it comes to the resource consent. So the people looking at that know all this stuff. You know. I, I think you, you're right, and probably the, the background of what I was explained may need to set about the criteria, which are the criteria is set out in the Nelson LDM right. in terms of assessing permeability Sure, sure, I understand that. It's probably more the area on the flat where you're going to be going to be doing that, you know, that 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 work there. Yeah, and I think that's been noted. Yeah, which yeah. Mr. Mills has said that. Yeah. Yeah. So I think okay. it's been noted. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Um, let's just after one. Do you want to break? I, well, I think we may as well finish this witness, I think, because um, I'm not sure how... You, you, are, you just taking, are you just taking questions now, or is there more you want to add, Mr Foley? I'm happy to take questions. Do you have further questions, Mr Foley? Do you? Yes. Yeah. Um, it's not directly related to what you've just commented, which has been really useful, thank you, but it has been suggested that it would be useful for the panel to visit the, the Bayview site to see that what's sort of... I guess see the development there and how it is being the land, the earthworks management is being managed. Um, my question is how similar is that Bayview site from a, I know you've said there are different soil types through both locations, but how similar is that Bayview site to the steeper areas where there might be, not the, not the areas where there's not going to be any ac activity, but where there w is likely to be earthworks, how comparable would those yep. two sides of the hill be? The materials, as I said, there, there are some materials that are quite different to what will be experienced on the, on the Melvin Hills and in Kaka, um, but there are some materials that are similar, okay, that's number one. But the process of what's been followed at Bayview is a similar process, and I, just, I think, I asked Richie to correct me if I'm wrong, I think we discussed 22 sediment ponds, correct. 22 sediment ponds have been built in the last two years very much as part of an adaptive management plan. We've learned, we've, we've got um, better knowledge on how the different materials have performed, and we've adapted both the earthworks methodology and the silt pond layout to suit that. During that time of two and a half years, I think we're up to the seventh revision of the, um, con of, of the construction management plan, which includes environmental controls. And so we are looking at, essentially, at less than six month intervals, we are looking at the whole site, we are managing to where areas are becoming open for earthworks, and managing where areas are becoming closed and stabilised. So that process, which is very much an adaptive, an adaptive plan, learning from the experience that we've got um, to improve performance, would be one that I would see would be replicated in terms of, so to go and to understand the whole concept of what's been done at Bayview would be informative. And can you just comment um, based, what was the rain event on Tuesday and how did the works perform? I normally look at the rain every day. Know. I think it was about 60, <laughs> 64, mils. 64 mils, thank you very much. 64 mils, that exceeded, a, it exceeded, our, that exceeded our consent design performance requirement. Um, but we had no issue, no, we had no discharge, and council did come and do a observation on that day, and they were happy with what they saw. Yeah. So we, we say that the site, I think, in my, in my opinion, compared to to many of the sites that I've been engaged in over the years, is using a um, a, a very very much best practice approach, and um, and and is really implementing the adaptive management approach. Yeah. Do you have any further questions? I don't have a question of Mr Foley, I just have a question of Mr Parsonson who's just 
probably won't realise them. Mr Parsonson, just a question for you. Um, arising out of Mr Foley's evidence, does that change anything, any of your statements or the, the, the opinions that you've expressed, or is your evidence based on your understanding of what Mr Foley has said? Because, I mean, I think what Mr Foley is saying is there is lesser amounts of earthworks and therefore sediment than, than Mr Ridley was suggesting there might be. Yep, thanks. So my, my evidence was based on um, a sort of a, a, a broad estimate of the maximum area that was going to be zoned, but with the understanding that, in fact, within that, there will be a lesser area of earthworks. I didn't want to emphasise that too much because right. I, I was confident in the overall approach anyway. anyway. Um, and it's also been informed by Mr Foley's evidence and expertise in terms of the local soils and geology, which, again, uh, reinforces the fact that not only is um, the USLE um, not ideally suited for that sort of calculation because of the rock no, within right. the site, but also the fact that it reinforces our confidence that it can be adequately managed in terms of sediment effects. Right. Thank you. That was helpful. Anything further from Mr Parsons? Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr Marston. It is slightly after one o'clock, and I think what we will do is take the lunch break, and I think, is it, then we're coming back from Mr Lyle, is that the other? That's the idea. I just want to. Yeah, I just asked Mr. Foley, Foley to put that um, oral piece into writing. That would be very helpful. Um, thank you for that. Um, thank you, Mr. Foley. <coughs> um, as I said, we thought your initial evidence was very clear, hence is why we didn't need to cover it. But I think, as I said, you've provided that rebuttal, and I think it's been very useful to hear that. Um, in response to the questions and the other witnesses. Thank you. So, um, yeah, we'll come back after lunch with Mr. Long. Oh, so, I think, so, so we'll come back at, we'll take the full hour, I think, give everyone a break. So, if we come back at 10 past two. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner, there's just one, no, sorry. one procedural matter I'd like to raise, um, but I can hold off until after lunch if you. Well, raise it now that we, can, if we, if we have to you. think about it over lunch. Uh, it's just that I, I hadn't actually been aware that there was rebuttal evidence from Mr Foley. I was now. I was going to think. I was going to ask you that. So there. So there is, yes. um, and it was in relation to your witness. It's about two pages long. Um, I mean, yeah, so the, I mean, they just. It, if things are going to be filed late. I'm not checking the website every day to find things that have been filed late. So. Now, just on that, it wasn't filed late. Um, you might recall that in our directions we enabled your, because of the addendum 42A report, right. that process, we allowed extra time for your witnesses to provide anything else, which um, your expert did. And also in that same later direction, we said because of the lateness, we would allow experts uh, we would allow rebuttal evidence on that right up until, and it could be brought at the hearing. So it's not technically right. late. I'm just sorry that you weren't aware about it. Of it, um, it's it's now on. It's in the on Thank the you. website, and it's under. I, Ms. Michelle, is it under rebuttal or applicant's rebuttal? So it's a it's a statement by Mr. Foley. Right, thank yeah, you. Yeah, well, yeah. Mr. Sodjic's been listening, so I right, imagine so he'll be able to go and find it now. But <coughs> it, yeah, it, we just don't get um, necessarily get updates about things being uploaded, no, so maybe. it's good to know that that's there. No. So, okay. in fact, thank you for raising because I was going to I was going to ask you if you were aware of it, and um, that. No, I wasn't. All right. So, as I said, it's a short brief. It's in fact it's only two pages, so he, it won't take him long thank to you. get his head around it. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. <coughs>
Is it a good idea? I don't see it. If you put a bloody heat gun on it, you'll see a little cold spot in the corner. It's a it's um oh, I don't believe it's enough. Um, all the experts do the scientists say it's enough to actually permeate backwards in the room makes sense. If you stand a metre away from standard double closing, you can feel the cold. And you go to film the frame um, with the um capital you know, mm. gas yeah, got this little. Uh, it's um I think two hundred millimetres. Um, and I said, what, what about the curtains? Oh, oh no, we hadn't taken that in. So, yeah. <laughs> so nobody has curtains in New Zealand. I'm here. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. If we reconvene um, for the afternoon session, <laughs> just been in discussion with. Um, Ms McShay and, and Ms Day um, for tomorrow, because we we had provided more time tomorrow morning for Mr Lyle if it's needed, and I don't think it's going to be needed because we're a bit unsure how long it was going to take. So we're going to um, contact submitters to see whether they can start coming in earlier tomorrow morning. Um, and of course, because of the lateness, we don't know whether they all will or not. So the plan is that we will start tomorrow at 9.30, a little bit later, and, um, and I'm sure we'll have some submitters who we can start with. I'm hoping it's not going to be too lumpy, but we'll make contact with them and try and bring everybody forward, um, which might mean we might finish a little bit earlier tomorrow afternoon as well. So, and that, so the key message is we're going to start at 9.30 tomorrow. Um, we'll, we'll hopefully have a, an updated hearing schedule first thing in the morning. The other thing is that, um, depending on how long we're out with Mr Lyle, um, today would be a good day uh, if you wanted to go out to Bayview. Um, we were talking about that at lunchtime. Um, and what we think um, we will do is um, not go today. I mean, one, some of us, me, also want, because we've got submitters tomorrow, I want to, I want to get on top of the submitters and okay, submissions and read those. That's fine. And we think we, we think we should, com I mean, I think we want to hear from submitters and there might be a number of things that we might want to go back and have a look at, okay. um, including this, you know, the stream realignment consent process that you outlined in Bayview and, um, and other things. Okay. Yeah. All right, so Mr Lyle. Kia ora. Um, I don't need to introduce myself. I've obviously you know who I am um, now. Um, I've prepared this um, verbal summary just as an introduction as an, and an update to my evidence in chief, which was um, dated the 15th of June, and also my rebuttal ev evidence, which was the 7th of Ju uh, July. And over the course of the last two days, there's been further discussion that has, from my perspective, as the applicant's planner, tasked with undertaking the overall planning assessment further confirmed, has further confirmed the conclusions I have made in my primary evidence. That conclusion is that PPC 28 provides a significant opportunity on a large piece of land in close proximity to Nelson City to contribute to a well-functioning urban environment and achieve the purpose and principles of part two and the RMA. So that's come directly from my conclusion. And I'd like to emphasise here um, that we've sought to undertake a fully integrated approach across all aspects, only enabled by the cooperation of the two landowners on this very big site in close proximity to town. And in terms of environmental outcomes, we have openly and genuinely tried to incorporate best practice into the provisions of Schedule X, in advance of a district-wide second generation plan being available and giving effect to the current national planning framework. Having listened to the questions raised by the panel and against the background of matters raised in the Section 42A reports, including the addendum, I consider there is some further work to do on the mechanics of the rules and schedule legs, as well as to the supporting policy framework. The complexities of drafting policy have also been acknowledged by the panel and with changes made along the way, including additional information requirements, there is a need to pull everything together. Schedule legs has, has in fact been changed um, a number of times um, at each phase within the uh, first schedule process to date. And I, open, I, I have openly acknowledged the need to keep an open mind and make further changes as the need arises. In recognition of this, 
um, I am currently working on version 4. I'm also in contact with Ms Sweetman about the provisions and gathering input um, from the wider consultant team in terms of uh, improvements that need to be made and I understand Ms Sweetman has also asked the same question of um, her team. And we've arranged further conferencing on those matters tomorrow, um, which is really the earliest possible time, um, given that we have to both be in attendance over the first two days, and early next week if need be to iron out the wrinkles. Related to this, I'm also in further discussions with Mr Toya on behalf of Ngāti Kawata in response to the questions from um, Commissioner Tapania and this relates to the CIA requirement and also to the language surrounding the principle of tino rangatiratanga. And um, Hemi has given me some guidance on that and will continue that dialogue over the next few days. Hemi's um, not able to be here um, this afternoon for this first part. So I guess in the, um, there's a few other points, I guess, in, um, from my notes that I've made um, over the course of the last couple of days. Um, one um, was in relation to the new national policy statement on urban development, which um, sort of escaped um, our recognition. Um, I um, now have seen it, I've reviewed it overnight, um, and I um, have seen the change made, and I think the principal change is obviously to pr um, providing for, in the definition of planning decisions, um, the private plan change um, um, recognition or change to a plan requested under part two, um, which is obviously something that um, Ms Sweetman and I already agreed on in terms of the wider mm. interpretation of the NPS, but it's obviously very helpful just to get that out of the way because it was a bit of a distraction, obviously. I was going to um, talk about the FDS, or the, the current FDS and the draft FDS, um, I think I've been pretty clear in my evidence in chief and in my rebuttal about where I, where I sit on, on those. Um, I concur with Mr Marson that really the NPS is the primary guiding document in terms of how to give effect to those national objectives. So um, I'm not placing a significant amount of weight on the current FDS. Um, when I prepared the plan change request, um, the FDS um, was, um, had been adopted, um, but was pre, uh, well it was actually during the um, COVID, the COVID um, period where the housing crisis just went berserk. Um, and so um, essentially what I'm saying is that I think, and I've always said the FDS needs to be updated and it's in the process of being updated. We still have a housing crisis and we still have those national objectives to meet. Um, um, Commissioner Tapania asked uh, a question um, this morning, I think it was of uh, Dr. Dr Robinson, about um, the policy um, about protection um, on Kaka Hill. Um, just, uh, just a note, that policy has been there, I think, from the start, and um, this was before the revegetation overlays were added. Um, so essentially the policy's context is about protecting the significant natural area um, on Karka Hill and the landscape values on Karka Hill. But they, they, their intent was to talk to those specific, <coughs> those specific values, significant values, that we identified first up. So I guess um, it may be that in my discussions with um, Ms Sweetman we have to double back on that um, because of the, the wider um, aspirations now in terms of revegetation and improvement. But I just wanted to clarify that that was the intent as currently worded was to deal with those specific values. The SNA was identified by Council and we picked up that layer as a part of the Nelson plan work um, and, the, and the landscape values were obviously um, Mr Mellon's work, having, having picked up the Boffin Muscle values. Um, another question um, which I have answered was in relation to the not having a master plan, um, but over lunch I've just contemplated that a little further 
and in my, my response to that, I mentioned the previous plan changes, and in my evidence in chief and attachment two, I provided you a copy of Schedule U um, to the Nelson Resource Management Plan, and um, to the best of my knowledge, a master plan was not provided with that plan change, but it's a condition of, the, mm. of that schedule that a master plan be submitted um, with um, the development um, that went forward. So um, that was, I guess, a signal to me about um, what was acceptable in, in these circumstances mm. as well. And um, Schedule U is also a substantial site um, with ridge lines and um, backdrop with, obviously, as I've mentioned already, um, building enabled in those landscapes in a controlled way. Um, another question um, arose around, I think it was in the context of the um, consultation that we did um, with the Titao Ihu Iwi um, around culverts and fish passage. Um, to be honest, we didn't get down to that level of detail because um, the, the journey that we went on with with the eight iwi was really about, um, first of all, and there was quite a number of hui and teams meetings and, and site visits as well, was really about explaining to them, we're trying to um, come up with a, a set of provisions that keep them informed and keep them involved um, and significantly in a, in a way that I don't think has been done before, um, that I've seen at least. Um, yes, we have statutory acknowledgements in relation to freshwater, um, and um, I fully would have expected if we were, if we were having, uh, dealing with fresh water in terms of resource consent processes, we would have to do consultation and do CIA work. But what we're volunteering is something much more significant than that, um, which was recognised and I think is fully recognised in the submissions and the feedback we got in the, um, from iwi. Um, and I should say that that was not um, a walk in the park. Um, nor did we expect it to be, but you can understand we've got eight, we've got like eight local iwi. Um, and um, so I probably have to come back to that issue again because, well, I will in terms of the CIOs, but um, I do appreciate and they trust that um, we're going to deliver on, on um, that expectation. And um, how we do it, we'll have to give some serious thought to because I think they will need to nominate probably a representative on their behalf to help coordinate the, the various inputs. Can't have one person speaking for everyone, it just, just doesn't work, it's not realistic. Um, but thankfully some other experience I've had recently in Awaroa um, where there's multiple iwi interests, they have elected to nominate uh, one person to help them through these processes where you've got a variety of iwi, so I do think it's, it's possible and that's what we're aiming towards. Um, there's been a lot of um, discussion and questioning around why we have only volunteered a 40 metre wide minimum um, Esplanade Reserve. Um, yeah, it could keep you awake at night trying to um, come up with the right words around that, but I think it's worth just coming back to that myself because obviously as the author with a team of uh, multidisciplinary people, I think I need to explain that again. Um, I guess um, you've probably all had um, experience in this field where you're used to having a, a, a set esplanade um, um, width on, on streams and rivers. In Nelson, um, those widths are variable and they've been designed in response to the context or the significance of those resources. Um, it's a bit of a mess, I should say, in the current plan. Um, because there's no reserve required through the initial Kaka Kalat Valley floor area. So um, what we decided is we needed to fix that. Um, but also with the structure plan, um, if you could just picture the width of the, um, ripe, the environmental enhancement area that is zoned open space in the initial part of Kaka um, Valley floor, that's significantly wider than 40 metres and it's a variable width. So um, that was my first problem, coming up with a, a rule that, um, one, related to the structure plan, um, but two, then dealt with the upper kaka above the wall shed. So dealing with the upper section, which is really where the rubber hits the road, if you like, um, the, the current rules in the Nelson plan 
um, refer to the bed width in the annual fullus flow. It's not from bank to bank. Mm. Um, <coughs> so that's an incredibly complex um, mm. calculation, obviously with topography and grade and everything coming into it as well. And then when you, train, when you think about that in terms of how, that's, how is that going to apply to the upper Kaka, where you've got actually two very distinctive terraces on either side that are not the bank, because the annual flow is, um, and, I've, and I've spoken to Mr Philippi over lunch in relation to what that means if we would apply that rule in this context, is that it would, and this is based on NIWA rainfall um, data, it would probably be conservatively four to eight metres of the of the footprint in the in the very foot of the um, Kaka Valley floor, but between the two terrace banks, we've got between probably forty and eighty metres where it meanders um, up the valley, as you can appreciate as you're driving up the up that terrace. So your mental picture of well, what the Esplanade Reserve be, be from that from that terrace edge is not is not the case. So it's a complex thing. Um, obviously, as you as you go further up the valley, the topography very much steepens on the northern northwestern side, um, and there's pinch points on the on the eastern side. So. In response to the multidisciplinary approach that we wanted to take was that, well, we volunteer these principles that require these things to be um, knitted together in the design process, and then we have to demonstrate to you in the application that we've actually responded to all of those factors in the application. So the, the, that's a key wording in that X9 principle, is a demonstration of water of those, those um, low impact or water sensitive design principles that cross over admittedly into engineering, into terrestrial freshwater ecology, landscape and recreational values. So um, I guess sitting here as someone primarily in the coalface thinking well how is that going to play out? Well first of all that's a significant undertaking to come up with a <coughs> with a design that addresses all of those factors. It requires the same team to be essentially involved all the way through. It requires um, very um, well thought out and comprehensive um, sets of technical reports. Um, and I don't want to list all the various parts of the NRMP that I have already in the, in the plan change request, um, but there is Appendix 14, there's the Land Development Manual, there's the listed Section 88 stuff. There's assessment criteria. You know, on and on and on. It's a. It's going to be a. It's going to be a very comprehensive um, undertaking to demonstrate <coughs> in a report that we've dealt with all of those factors. So, if you think these guys just want to give you 40 metres, that's not the case. In fact, the the shape of the Karka corridor is actually meandering and um, in reality I think the actual Esplanade Reserve that's vested will be significantly more than 40 metres. Having said that, when it comes to the consent process, and I know what the verbal um, feedback was from Mr Petherham on behalf of the reserves team, is that I don't want any more than I need because you know, so I guess that's only one aspect of council's thinking. There's also the engineering department, which have a different budget and a different uh, maintenance um, mindset. They don't want stuff either necessarily. So um, there's a lot of work to do, and um, I haven't even mentioned. I mean, I mentioned earlier the cultural side, but you've got to add that layer on it as well. And to um, Stu Ferrance input to Mark Foley's input, and to um, Damien Filippolo's input, and to Morris's input, and to Tony Milne's input, and to Hugh Nicholson's input. Um, we actually think we've got a pretty good format, and maybe we need to improve the way it's communicated, and I take that on the chin. Um, but there is a rationale behind it, and um, we're certainly not trying to cut any corners, we're actually trying to do um, genuine integrated management of this resource. Um, 
Um, that's probably um, the, the top of my list <laughs> um, things that I noted from questions. Um, obviously, sitting there um, waiting my turn to sort of pull that stuff together. <laughs> Um, and I'm, I'm fully prepared to um, receive a number of questions about the mechanics and other parts, so happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr Lyle. Um, I'm going to head off with questions, and I think we'll get to the mechanics um, <clears throat> um, at the end of those, those questions. Um, but just a comment, I, I, I think I agree with you in the sense of Within this set of provisions, um, and, I, and I think it's acknowledged in the Addendum 42A report too, that it's moved a long way towards being, I'll just use that term, more acceptable. Um, and, 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 the, and there's a lot of things in there which are, are probably appropriate. And I think the questions that we've got, and I've sort of got, is really how it all holds together. Yeah. And, I, and I think just looking at the Addendum 42A report and, and Ms Sweetman's um, table, this one here, yep. where I think she has some of the same concerns, and I, I think between the two of you, you may well be able to work a lot of those things out. Mm -hmm. um, and, and broadly, having gone through that document, which was attached to the port addendum, a, a lot of that I would support in terms of the comments that have been raised, so a, as a useful starting point. Um, but to go, to go right back up to the top of the tree, though, in terms of this entire plan change, and just looking at the, um, the national policy statement on, on urban development. <clears throat> And I think it is your position, and it certainly came through the joint witness statement between you and, and, and Ms Sweetman, that you, you think it applies, um, it needs to be applied um, in its full extent and not limited by the Eden Epsom decision, and, you, and then the joint statement you set, you set that out, um, or seen in a wider, so you, you maintain that view. Absolutely, um, yeah. And obviously with that recent change, um, it removes any doubt, I would have thought. Yeah. I um, asked Mr Nicholson, and, and in relation to that, I asked Mr Nicholson yesterday about this, this term urban sprawl that a number of submitters have been using, um, that, that this proposal, if it goes ahead, would be urban sprawl. In the context of that national policy statement and, and your planning understanding of urban sprawl, what, what's your response to that? Yeah, I mean, I don't think sprawl is um, a word that I would um, um, consider fits at all with um, what's planned for the site. Um, I think that one of the answers, it may have been actually Mr Milne um, who um, articulated this, um, was that really that word, that word sort of um, is more akin to um, sprawl on a plains, you know, the, whether it's Canterbury or whether it's Waimea Plains, you know, it, it, it's more just carry on, it's just take more land in the rural context and, and, the, and the urban area just gets bigger and bigger. I don't. I don't think that's what's planned here. Um, it's it's much more responsive. Um, it's contained. Uh, I think that's significant. It's a contained landscape. Um, in fact, um, there's a lot of people that actually didn't realise the Kaki Valley even existed, even though they spent a lot of time in the Mai Tai. They just haven't haven't actually thought that there was a valley catchment up behind the trees behind the behind Denny's Hole. I mean, I know there's a lot of people that do because they spend a lot of time in that environment. There's a lot of people that don't as well. So, um, yeah, I, I don't see this as urban sprawl. It's a, um, it's a bespoke response to urban growth on a site that has a significant absorption capacity um, in the valley catchment at least. Um, and um, it's very close to town. It's no different than many of the Stoke Valleys and the Brook Valley, for example, that in the past has been urbanised. So Nelson does have an urban pattern simply through topography where development has had to move into the valleys. It's had to because this, the topography mm -hmm. um, and, and for some areas is just too steep. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, and again, I know some of this is in your evidence, but I really just want, want uh, confirmation. Um, and while you said you're not relying particularly on, on the future development strategy or looking at other council um, strategy documents, um, it got raised, you say, there is this idea that, um, <clears throat> and certainly coming through submissions, that intensification is a better way to go than greenfield development, and to kind of extrapolate that even further to say you should not have any further 
expansion and you should focus only on intensification. Yeah. What's, what's your planning response to that again, and again in terms of the national policy statement on yeah. urban well, development? Um, as is recorded in the, um, I think the very first conferencing session with the economist, the NPS no longer has that preference between one or the other. Hmm. Um, it's now um, any form of um, sustainable development that, that meets that criteria is, is valid in terms of meeting growth, which I think is absolutely logical. Likewise, well, on, a, on a number of fronts, um, it simply wouldn't provide for everyone's needs if everyone had to live in intensification. As simple as that. I mean, the well-functioning urban environments, um, you know, um, provide, has to provide for a range of needs. Um, so intensification in Nelson cannot do that on its own, for a start. Um, I've made some personal observations about what I think that means in terms of affordability. I think intensification is going to be expensive. Um, I know um, Ms Jepp has challenged me on my um, qualifications in that respect, and absolutely I'm not a valuer and I'm not a real estate agent, but I've done probably 95% of the intensification, true intensification projects in Nelson City, and I know what the sales figures are because I've obtained them, and they are not affordable for the most part of the community. So um, I do believe that Greenfield is not only provides for a wider range of needs, um, but it will also um, provide for a wider range of the community in terms of um, affordability. And, and sorry, I was, before I know you've probably got more questions, but this no. site has the significant advantage of providing for comprehensive housing in the flatter areas, which will be the cheaper houses. I'm not saying they're going to be cheap, because nothing is really cheap nowadays. Um, and then as you move into the um, sloped areas, they'll be more expensive. You get up into the ridge line, they're going to be extremely expensive. So we are providing for a variable response, a variable housing across the site to, to meet a range of different affordability, affordabilities. The comprehensive housing tool is a significant part of that, a significant part of that. Mm. Mm. Does anyone else have any, any I'm, I'm going to move on to something else, but anyone have questions on that? Um, again, it's been made quite clear to us, and we accept it in terms of that we, we are to give, I mean, plan changes are to give effect to those higher order documents, the National Policy Statement on Urban Development and the National Policy Statement on Fresh Water Management. The focus, most of this discussion has been really around the, the alignment or the realignment of, of the Kaka stream. And again, we've had a range of expert evidence and we've got the council's position, we've got um, Ms Jepp's legal submissions. Um, and the question that we've been putting to all the witnesses and I've made quite clear is it doesn't seem, there doesn't seem to be any contention between any of the experts that the outcome has to be a restoration and protect or protect and restore, whichever way you're looking at it, restore it or, um, or improve it. Um, and that reflects te mana or te wai and it reflects you know, the, the policy statement. The, the policy framework that you've framed up clearly has a preference um, or, or certainly gives a policy in to the realignment um, as a better outcome. And, and that, that's certainly the position taken by the applicants' experts. I just want to reconfirm: is that, from a planning perspective, and this idea that, and that, that Mr. Marston talked about, you say about you know avoid doesn't mean absolutely don't ever do it. I mean, if you can do something better, what's your what's your planning response to that? Well, I guess first of all, we've openly acknowledged that um, the structure plan does not lead to realignment. A resource consent application will, re will lead to realignment, and and that is no that's not an insignificant piece of work in itself. Mm. Um, but as a team, we are firmly of the, of the view that we want to do the best thing for the environment and the best thing, the, the best freshwater outcome is to realign that stream. Back. So your, your clients do, you, what's your view? I absolutely, I, I'm, I'm fully on board. No, no. Um, I mean, we've had multiple versions of the um, structure plan well before the plan change was formally um, lodged, finalised. Um, but I, from memory, that's always been the group's um, collective view that 
that would be the best freshwater outcome, the best environmental outcome if the stream was realigned. So the, the, the thought that um, the stream could remain and simply be enhanced, I think, is slightly erroneous, in my opinion, because that is, if, if the rezoning goes ahead, then that is not going to look the way it looks at the moment. That will be, that has to be significantly rebuilt on probably still a different alignment to be an efficient stormwater corridor. So mm. it's still going to be significantly redeveloped in that, in that, that existing length. Thank you. I mean, your position is clear. Am I right, am I right in, in looking at the plan? I mean, you understand the Nelson Resource Management Plan much better than I do, I'm sure. Um, that realigning the stream, is it, is it at least a discretionary activity? Is yes, it, it is. Yeah. I mean, well, I've referred to Groom Creek, um, right, yeah. which is a Friends of the Mai Tai um, project with Nelson City Council. We obtained the resource consent for Nelson City Council. It was. Um, there was, a, I've attached those consents. Yeah, um, so it's against that experience, obviously, that I, I, I understand that um, with good design, you can enhance freshwater values. That was a 270 metre realignment of a stream. Um, coincidentally, um, maybe not coincidentally, mm. um, Morfam, Morfam were the designers of that um, realignment. And they were the authors of the of the um, project Mahitahi um, report on on the on the river and, and what could be done to enhance it. So um, I take a lot from that experience. Um, Just talk us. Was that a notified process? No. Dealt with how was it, was it completely non-notified? Non-notified with a with a with a CIA. All approvals of. Yeah. Well, obviously. Um, I'd expect probably independent um, commissioner signing off the decisions. Okay, right. Um, but you know, had had detailed design, um, had landscape report, um, geotech. Um, yeah, you know, had the had the had the bells and whistles that you'd have to have if you're going to realign a stream leading into the Mai Tai. Um, but 270 metres, you know, we I think ours is 350 from memory. Um, and obviously it's slightly more than the 270, but we're not talking, it, was, it wasn't just a 10 metre realignment, it was a 270 metre alignment for the very purpose of improving water quality, nutrients and sediment. So it does demonstrate what can be done with good design and um, for the purpose of enhancing water quality. Can you just talk us through your understanding? This is about the green belt and the way that the plan cast out there's provision. You know, we talked about the green belt and we had quite a discussion with the landscape architects and urban design about that. From a planning perspective, how, I don't know if you had experience, how, how, have you, how do you understand that green belt provision to work and, and, and how does it apply here or not apply? Well, I guess having been in Nelson for, um, or since 1994, uh, um, the city, the two cities were actually very different and the green belt was actually Saxton Field to be honest. Um, that was primarily what you could say is the green belt between Nelson and Tasman and um, you know defined defined the, the boundaries mm -hmm. and you know it's, and it's and it still does largely. Um, so yeah it's, it's an edge it's an edge in terms of a, um, a settlement is how I see a green belt. Um, some of them are better than others obviously. Um, here, um, to the extent the Mai Tai Valley is a is a green belt, it's obviously a green it's a green corridor. You know, it's got a primarily a recreational um, amenity, um, but the site is set back away from away from that corridor, it's, and it's fairly well hidden, in my opinion. Yes, there are glimpses through once you get to the cricket ground, but before then you you don't. Um, so. I don't see the Mai Tai Valley as a green belt in terms of entrance and exiting a city. Mm -hmm. um, it's a valley catchment, it's a dead end. Thank you. A um, couple more, just specific ones. Um, th this I, th again, it came through the joint witness statement. This is this, is, um, this prohibited activity status on the skyline and backdrop for Kaka Hill. 
and through the expert conferencing it was determined between, uh, I think it was agreed between you and Ms Wheatman that non-complying, it, do, it doesn't go into any great explanation. So can you just explain yeah. to me what, why it ended up where it ended up? Yeah, um, so, um, I mean, we, hand on the heart, we thought that that was the right thing to do because it was actually protecting Kaka Hill, the significant natural area on Kaka Hill, um, in, including the um, top of Kaka Hill in terms of the landscape um, from built development. So that's why we took the heavy, took the heavy yeah. policy um, into that, uh, roll into that um, framework. Um, <coughs> And I guess um, I was challenged um, on that in terms of whether it could be justified under Section 32 and um, thought, well, uh, yeah, potentially not, <laughs> probably not. Um, but the, that, that was the reason, it was because it was a protectionist approach. Right. Fully protectionist. Can I just, so is it, is it your planning, I mean, given that answer, is it, and what was notified, is it your planning view that non-complying in that somewhat more limited area, now this is, as you know, that in that sort of, um, on the Kaka Hill backdrop and skyline, is it your planning opinion that the non-complying activity is the more appropriate planning provision or is it prohibited? And I'll come back to this whole issue of the scope thing in a second, so I'll just put that aside for a moment. Mm still provides a very high level of protection. Well, you can't get any higher. <laughs> yeah, apart from prohibited. Oh, mm -hmm. oh sorry. Oh, sorry, I thought you said that, yeah. Well, non-complying is still... Well, I suppose that go, that's the question. I mean, if it is the appropriate activity status, are you, and it's a second question, are you satisfied that the objectives and policies that you've... I'm, I'm, I'm satisfied that the objectives and policies would still be achieved through the non-complying activity status. What do you mean achieved? I mean... Well, it would, are, are they a pro are they protect, directive in the sense that would still protect those values? Right, okay, right. Yeah. So, come back to my first question. So, you think non-complying is the appropriate activity status and not prohibited? Yes, I think it's probably more appropriate to be non-complying. But if but if there was a scope issue, yeah. Well, Mr. Marson's going to cover it, and because it came back, you know, I raised the issue yesterday about whether there was ability, and Mr. Marson said, well, there's lots of submissions saying maintain the status quo, um, i.e. don't do all this and leave it as it is, and, and this is rural and it's going to remain rural. Um, what, is the, what, what is the status quo in terms of if, if that provision wasn't put in place, what's, what does the plan currently provide? The plan doesn't currently contain significant natural areas, for a start. Um, not um, in its current provisions in the NR right. NRMP. I mean, the SNA comes through in the Nelson plan, not not through the NRMP. Right. Um, it does have still the landscape overlay um, in the current plan, um, which um, allows allows buildings and subdivision as a controlled activity. As, as per the rural zone provisions? Yes. Yeah. Right, okay, yeah. that's clear, thank you. I've got a little bit more to go on there. Um, my final um, points come to this whole issue of non-notification, yep. and you have been quite clear in your evidence what it applies to and, and what, it, what it does and what it doesn't apply to. And um, if I'm reading your evidence correct, you are saying that largely you have adopted the standard practice in the rest of the national uh, the Nelson Resource Management Plan, which for comprehensive housing and subdivision doesn't require notification or or affected a party approval. Essentially, is that is that the, really the position? It's not largely; it's entirely. Entirely right. Okay. Entirely. So, um, just to provide a bit of context. The Nelson Resource Management Plan has a, sub a general subdivision rule, then it has another subdivision rule for the services overlay, then it has another subdivision rule for the landscape overlay, if we just ignore comprehensive housing for now. So what I've done is I've combined those three rules, because it's pointless and it's pretty awkward if you realise you're a controlled activity but then you can't be because of the services overlay. Right, yeah. So. 
I've simply combined those rules into the RDA classification because you get there anyway through those through the other rules. Mm -hmm. I've included the same assessment criteria or the same information requirements and the same notification test as in the current plan for the RDA. So it's it's entirely it's exactly the same rules combined in the plan. So there's no we're not cutting we're not providing an, a a um, um, a special um, leg up right, right. for subdivision here. It's the same rules that are in the plan now, just combine them. Looking at it in terms of in section 32, and it's been made quite clear, you know, th there is no presumption that the status quo is, is the most appropriate. It's open to an applicant in this case mm -hmm. to, to say there is something more appropriate. Yeah. Have you, I mean, taking it over because it's consistent in the plan, I can understand, but is it your view in Section 32 terms, given 2022, given some of the issues that we've been raising, that non-notification is still appropriate now? Notification's got a horribly, you know, very, I, I mean, as Mr Marson has got a horribly complex sort of changing... It's only, an, it's only an RDA if you comply with those RDA standards. But I'm, I'm, well, I accept that. Oh, so what? What you're saying? So if you don't, then it becomes discretionary, and therefore the notification provisions, correct? That that one doesn't apply. Correct. Yeah. Right. So, well, can you give us an opinion? And therefore, how often? I mean, you might not be able to answer. How often do you think then the non-notification provisions are likely to kick in? So it's so that it won't be notified. Well, in my experience, I would say it's reasonably likely that you won't necessarily fully comply with the RDA status because of the engineering standards, for example. So you have to, you have to fully comply with the, right. with the engineering standards in order to benefit from that right. classification. Right. So it, there, there are lots of, lots of things that could trip you over to, into a, something harder. Something else. So let's just round that out. Just short point is that, that your view, your planning view, is that the non-notification provisions, the way that you have proposed them, is appropriate? Correct. OK, thank you. I want to turn to the provisions, but before I do, are there any questions that, are there broader questions that we want to put to? Is it worthwhile, though, just talking about comprehensive housing along behind that same conversation? Because it, it, it is a different thing, if you like. Um, the comprehensive housing um, is provided for in the high density zone in Nelson City and the Wood specifically. Mm -hmm. So um, as, as a non-notified application without a density requirement still, whereas in other parts, in other parts um, it's not. So what I have done is I've picked up those same enabling provisions which I've openly said in the plan change request. I think they translate. Um, I've used those same provisions here so again, it's the high density zone provisions from the wood area mm -hmm. um, in town for comprehensive housing that um, are enabling on the plan change side and the high density zone. The important thing here to recognise is that while there's no density requirement, there, are, there is a significant design process and information requirement that must go with those applications. So it's flexible and it's, um, it encourages good design, um, but it is enabling, and we say it is very helpful in terms of the NPS, um, in terms of delivering a, a range of housing types. I'll come to some of that in the rules because they're kind of written in a way that were sort of, I was thinking, oh, that's interesting, but again, um, we are all commenting. We don't want to come with an Auckland-centric view. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I and I think I have struggled. Um, there are lots of people um, from outside of Nelson involved in this case. I have have struggled to um, bring everyone up to speed. <laughs> with that in mind, I've just I'm I'm using your rebuttal version of your provisions, and and some of the questions that I'll or, or comments that I'll make, some of them are sort of rhetorical, really. It's, um, it's really that it may be assisting in terms of, of what we were thinking, um, and there may be some that you want to respond to. Can I just clarify one thing so, about notification? Oh, yeah. So, Mr Lyle, I assume that with the Groom Creek example, 
the plan did not have a rule about notification. It's simply the council assessed it did not require notification. It's a fully discretionary activity, and that's got nothing to do with the notification okay. um, discussion we've just had because they're completely different rules. Different, exactly, plan. yeah. It's a freshwater plan. And so the, the non notification that we've just talked about it relate only to the subdivision and comprehensive housing. We can get tripped up on a lot. And I think I do understand that. That's why I think when I was going through, I said it's quite clear there are specific, and I think you've made that clear in your evidence, there are some specific rules which have it, but it doesn't apply across the board to everything. It's relatively limited to comprehensive housing and subdivision. Well, it's only limited. Yeah, right. Okay. Everything else has their own um, test in terms of notification. Right. Um, and I hope this is not going to be too laborious. Um, going through... Um, some of these provisions. So we step through, there are a number of additional, and again, this really reflects the way that Mr. Marsden, Marsden told us that the plan works in terms of a lot of the, well, these front up policies effectively go into the residential part of the plan, but um, will apply only to the Bayview area that's within the schedule. And um, again, just, Come comments again. You know there are a number of provisions and policy which talk about where appropriate and those sorts of things. Um, and and that would be in um, this is on page two policy RE 3.9 at C for example. It talks about ensuring any subdivision development design layout is consistent with the existing pattern of residential development on the northeastern where appropriate. And I. And I, I look at this, and first of all, I think, well, wh why do you want that? Why, why is that appropriate? But then when you say we're appropriate, I, I put my, myself in the mind of a, of a consenting officer looking at this and what that actually means. How, how, how does it assist them to do it? So there's just a theme in some of these. It's got that we're appropriate and all of those sort of things. Mm -hmm. Same sort of issue that, that Mr. Mark Brown. So I think um, those are some of things that I would be looking for in a, in a set of provisions. Um, to remove that kind of that level of discretion, which I think just is, becomes somewhat confusing. Um, sorry. Oh yes, sorry. Um, I had just a specific question on that one um, policy RE three point nine C. Um, the existing pattern of residential development on the north east side of the hills. Where's that? It should be northwest. Mm. Yeah, it might be. Yeah, I just assume Bayview, but that's because I hadn't. Mm. Yeah, and, 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 exactly. Yeah. In fact, um, we're there not. Are some advantages having a local. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and obviously, I I would strike out where appropriate. I don't actually think there's not. It's well, I, as I said, I don't want to be here to wordsmith. I really just want to kind of give you a flavour of what we're thinking. And it's the same thing like D ensuring careful design. And I wonder what is careful design when you're doing controlling the placement of buildings. I understand what you're saying, but and a lot of that's kind of reflected in, in some of the rules. So it's really, I think, just being clear what the outcome will, and this is a policy to achieve the objective. Um, what does a resource consent officer when they're processing a, a, an application look for? Um, coming over the page, onto page three, and just RE6 objective, and again, I think, Ms. Sweetman's picked it up, you know, you're starting with enabling and, 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 you know, like that, I mean, it's a policy. I think the objective needs to be the outcome. And, and then you have a whole list of those, A or A right through to F coming over the page, which I read are the how and, and I think a better cast in a policy context. So the, the objectives need to be crisper, the outcome, and then how it's done is the policy. And you've got that, they're all there, I think. Um, but again, there's a real mix as well. You've got, recognises the hierarchy of Timano OTY, enhances ecological results in well-functioning urban environments. So um, again, I, uh, from my perspective, I think you, know, you could write that in a much, much crisper way. And I think that's the same thing as reflected when you come across to RE 6.1, that whole issue of the structure plan. That, it, that is a policy, but a lot of it seems to repeat some of that, what's in that objective, and I think you could um, you, you could write that in a much more succinct way, is, is how I would be casting it if, if, if I were writing it. 
And then we come to that policy on cultural values, which we talked about yesterday, and I wonder if Ms Tepany wants to cover off that part of it. Um, yeah, and thank you for the clarification and comments you provided at the outset today, just um, responding to those matters that were raised yesterday. And I just, it's really important that I want to acknowledge your intention, um, and I appreciate that further discussions are still to be had with Mr Toyer as well, but I accept that, you know, this clearly, as you've acknowledged, is very important, and it's, um, you know, and it clearly reflects that partnership aspect and approach that this client, that the applicant has had to this development. Um, in terms of yesterday discussing with Mr Toya around that whole enabling tanga, uh, te noranga te tanga, which you've picked up and my discomfort with that, more around recognising, I guess, or giving effect to it. Um, but here in looking at the policy, again, it's framed in terms of rangatira tanga of the place, so it's the tino rangatiratanga of the significant place as opposed to the rangatiratanga of Wakatutanga te whenua. So um, my discussion clearly with Mr Toya highlighted Ngati Kuata's intention that they have the ability to determine for themselves how the values that they have in relation to Kākahu can be recognised. Um, and I guess my point, I guess, is I need to understand what is it that this policy is trying to achieve here. So is it... Um, the recognition or protection of the mana or integrity of Kākahu itself within its own landscape and its place in terms of that cultural landscape and relationship to the awa, etc. Or is it um, the relationship of tangata whenua, of wakatū to Kākahu? So they're two different kind of things. So I just, I think we just need to be really clear what is it the policy is trying to achieve. Um, and I agree with Ms Sweetman in terms of B that, um, that this needs to focus on policy direction. Um, you know, CIA is very a, a method. Um, so the SHEPO, for example, already incorporates tangata whenua values and mātauranga Māori. And, and I can tell that the intention here is to reflect Section 60 in terms of recognise and provide for the relationship. And it talks about consultation, talks about requiring CIAs, it talks about responding to and reflecting cultural values. So I think the focus there just needs to be on what it, again, what is it trying to achieve? Is it, you know, and sh you know because if you're already incorporating tangata whenua values in mātauranga Māori, then is it to ensure, I guess, that the expertise of um, Wakatū Tangata Whenua, for example, in terms of their own tikanga, um, is, you know, properly reflected and responded to, or something like that. Um, and again, around C's fine, it's, it's the 7A aspect. Um, yeah, sort of, sorry, um, 7A in terms of D is the kaitiakitanga, so again, not around enabling um, kaitiakitanga, because kaitiakitanga is both a right and responsibility of wakatū tangata whenua, but it's about giving effect to the exercise, I guess, of kaitiakitanga by wakatū tangata whenua. So just those sorts of things, I just, and, and I know that I've, I've read Ngāti Rārua's submission in particular, and they make some recommendations there. Whether they're appropriate, I'm, I'm not sure, and, and you can turn your mind to that, but I thought that was just really important to make sure that what is the objective, what are we trying to actually achieve? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, sorry, I'm not sure if that's helpful. But no, definitely Kia ora. And just continuing on, sorry, thank you. Are you good? Continuing on, just then, policy RE 6.3, this is the Integrated Catchment Management Tools and Principles. Um, <clears throat> I, just, I just put a question mark against the word, like sort of principles, but um, I'll come to that. Uh, B, particularly, require a stormwater management plan at the earlier stage. It, it, I mean, is it, and this is, it's a, this is a rhetorical question, is it the intent to lock in a stormwater management plan? Um, is the question I've got, and then at the earliest stage, and, and what does that really mean? And then it demonstrates the following principles, and I'm, and I, I'm thinking, is it, is it principles, or is it trying to demonstrate the outcomes? And we've talked about that before. What are the outcomes that you're trying to achieve? And again, when you've got that list that follows, some of those things I, I don't think are that you would put into a stormwater management plan, because there are some things which are wide, and, we, and Mr... Mark Brown talked about a catchment management plan, and I'm not sure that's the right word, but I think it's again thinking, what is it that we you are trying to achieve here in terms of a policy? 
do you want to lock in a particular method, which is the stormwater management plan, or is it you want to specify the outcomes, which might be a stormwater management plan? Yeah. Anyway, that's anyway, just... Yeah. And then just coming down to Jay, this whole issue that we have been discussing, because I mean, it talks about um, will be achieved, and it talks about the realignment of the lower carcass stream. So is it your intent to be very clear that it is going to be the realignment, or is it to restore and enhance freshwater ecological and biodiversity values, which may include the realignment stream? Or, you know, I'm just, that's for you to determine how directive you want to be. Um, in terms of in terms of those provisions, coming across to C on the next page again with the stormwater management plan it says ensuring that the approved stormwater management plan we will talk about this said who is approving the stormwater management plan um, so again it just comes back to what is what is this thing and what's the mechanism um, um, that it's intending to achieve. That, yeah, so that's the key. So again, it comes back to, and you use the word outcomes there, so that, that freshwater outcomes, you say are not compromised, but you know, what being just being clear what the outcomes are. Um, and those are sort of my general comments in terms of those, those provisions. I, my own view is that if, if, again, these are yours, but if they were written in a more crisper way, I think they would, they would flow better. Then coming to, just coming to the schedule, and I, I have, I, I, I think I have less, concern about the schedule, um, other than my general concern, and I think Ms Sweetman has it too, there are, it, some, of it, some of it's not clear to me yet how it actually, they get triggered into the provision. Some of them are clear when the rules reference back to these, um, these documents. So some of them are very clearly rules, um, and that's all, that's all fine. Could, um, I just, could I just jump in there? Obviously the numbering is all... The well, numbering is a bit all over the place. Because so yeah. I, think, I think my general comment is to be clear where there are, for example, um, you know, you've got the services overlay, um, and I think I can work it through how it applies, but it's not, to me, it's not entirely clear. Um, the additional earthworks requirements we've talked a lot about um, is almost written like a policy to ensure that these things happen and and you say these principles are complementary and shall be adopted in conjunction with the matters of control and discretion. So then I look at should they simply be matters of discretion or matters of control? It's just it's just clarity, I think, um, which is which is the key issue for me. Um, and then we're coming over to X8. This is a cultural values and engagement with um, with Iwi. Do you want to? I mean, again, it, we've talked about this. This is about this whole idea of whether a cultural impact assessment is always required and one may not be required. Do you want to cover that off or will you cover that off? Yesterday? No, I think we picked that up yesterday yeah. around making sure it's um, not you know, an absolute, yeah, so no, there my, needs to be a discretion um, there. My, my vision for has already um, included that okay. um, scenario of not having one. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, just sorry, in terms of the cultural, I think that the, the mistake that's made is um, you know, in, through, in terms of the policy, subdivision and development of Mai Tai Bay area shall incorporate Tangatuna values in Mataranga Māori. And the problem is it uses the word through. And I think when you use the word through, then you're straight away falling to a method type thing. So that, I think it's kind of like the trap. So maybe you replace the word through to to, to do what? To ensure, to protect, to achieve, or whatever. Sorry, I'm just... No, that's fine. I had prepared myself for this. <laughs> Come, um, so, so for example, I mean, just following that up, where you've got, and you know, it says any recommendation made in the cultural impact assessment, it might be wording like any cultural impact assessment. Again, it's that picking up Ms. Tepity's view that in some instances one may or may not be required, and so the implies the one, and it might be one that anyone that's been applied. I hope you agree with that. Yeah, I mean. Uh Remember, I referred you to the wording yesterday around COVID fast track um, refers to relevant iwi authority. Um, so, a uh, relevant iwi authority or a cultural impact assessment. Yeah, I'll, I'll um, and I take your point that you know you've got eight iwi here, but you know no sympathy. We've got eighteen in Tamaki Makoto, <laughs> and we've got issues of primacy. So, 
And, and again, a, a question that might be one of, of practice in Nelson. Just looking at on page 14, this is X3 subdivision general resource uh, residential zone, and it's the same with the backdrop. When I look at, um, coming back to the subdivision, subdivision is a restricted discretionary activity if it is accompanied by design and information requirements. Who, who does, I mean, what, in practice, who designs, decides that what's, that's, that's actually there and it's appropriate? I mean, it kind of seems to imply there's some sort of discretion there. Um, and it's the same when I come across, you come across to the building backdrop here when it says, it's a controlled activity if the final colour of any building's external roof uses a natural range of greys, browns or greens. How in practice is that determined at a, at a consent stage? Um, I mean, who decides that the grey is an appropriate grey, for example? There are, there are rules in the um, regionally, just say in Tasman, that have a coastal environment area provisions where they've got a, um, I'm sure Maxine is um, familiar with these as well, where they have um, a recessive colour palette. Um, so it's a coastal Tasman um, colour palette. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, maybe we need to pick up on that. Right. So, so you, are you satisfied that those, um, Ms. Day, do, do you have an opinion on that? I mean, I know you probably don't get involved in resource consent, so I'm not sure, but I mean, how in practice does somebody, so somebody has to decide that those things have been met and then presumably there's a discretion? Um, it, it's not a um, standard that's used uh, in the plan, certainly not in Tasman or Nelson, but there is a design palette that is used to assess mm. Um, colours and there is a range that are acceptable and so they are used when applying conditions of consent. But presumably, does somebody have to make a, a call straight up to say that, because if you don't comply with that then you're an RD, um, so somebody at some point early before a consent decision is made has to make the decision that it fits the controlled activity. I'll respond to that, Chair, if that's right. I have seen rules like this before with these types of conditions yeah. on them. So if it is a controlled activity, so a consent would be required. Right, yes. And the applicant would be required to demonstrate that they meet those conditions. Can I just add to that? Also, um, in Tasman, um, they have to submit um, their, their actual colours with the reflectors values with their, with their applications and their um, resource consents. And this is the bit where I'm just sort of going to, you know, what is local practice? Because uh, in my mind, I could see how buildings in that area are a controlled activity and the matters of control are all those colour issues. So there is no discretion. It's just that they're always going to be a controlled activity and the matters of discretion include colour and all of those sorts of things. And I think it's a bit more pronounced when there's that one um, about building above the ridge line. We've talked a bit, a bit about that. But again, um, I'll just leave that over to you and Miss Sweetman to have a look at. I mean, it may well be entirely appropriate the way they're cast. Um, in my view, it does seem to open up a, 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 a some level of discretion for somebody to decide. Yeah, we're, that, in particular, but, um, we have been working on this in the, in the background, probably in the back of the room, to be honest, um, with Ms. Gervin, Mr. Gervin and Mr. Milner looking at the administration of the height visibility to ridgeline and um, I know that at this stage um, they're collectively coming up with a better better rule that's more easy to administer. Right. Um, just a couple more, just coming across to X10 on page 20, the heritage structures, um, again this might be getting a bit deeper, <coughs> where you've got the demolition of the existing structures and I'm assuming you're meaning the, the, wall, uh, the sharing sheet because I think there are some dwellings or bits and pieces so I was just being careful which structures are they, um, if that rule to be retained. Um, coming down to the services overlay and the triggers, um, the development threshold just says prior to, uh, prior to new PP28 dwellings or lots. Can you just tell me how that works? Um, well, the, the track changes there we made um, to pick up on the recommendations of Mr. Georgeson, so um, that's why those changes were made. Um, but I suppose the issue, I, I, I'll tell you, specifically comes down to dwellings. I mean, what is the control here? So, that, so somebody could I mean, we, lot a lot. I'm assuming means subdivision. 
So is the, is the intent that before any development occurs that those things have to happen? Because I'm just looking at, and again, we faced this directly in some of the Drury plan changes where it was a, there was an attempt to control dwellings like that and there was this whole argument about using the Building Act as the control mechanism. It was determined that it was inappropriate to use the Building Act because the, um, it, in, a, in a Building Act situation, Mr Marston will know more than me, that if it meets the legal requirements of a structurally sound building, the council can't withhold a building consent. So I, all I'm, I'm saying is we need, I think it needs to be very clear what, what the trigger is. Yeah, I think, yeah, I, I, I see where you're coming from in terms of the subdivision and, and comprehensive housing development rules themselves. They essentially require, or they say that the infrastructure constraints identified in X11 have been, have been addressed and are operational. Which is, which is fine, I understand that. Um, so you, until they're operational, there will be no dwellings or, or, and no lot. But does, does that mean no building and no subdivision? Is that what the intent is? What it means is that the activity classification won't be restricted discretionary if those constraints haven't been addressed. It's not sure I'm entirely clear. I mean, it might just be the way it's expressed. So, um, I suppose just as my then my general comment is, mm. you can might just explain: is it clear that those upgrades, the transport upgrades, need to be in place and operational before that other, before a subdivision consent is granted? Is that is that what it's saying? Or can be finalised or a two two four C issued? What's it, what's it actually saying? Mm. I'll give that some more thought. Yeah. Okay. Right. I mean, I think the again, I think the intent is clear. I, I'm just, I'm just not sure um, it's clear to me. And I think, yeah, I think that's that's enough. Um, I just had still had a question on X15, which was raised earlier this morning, is that focus on domestic pets around the significance, assessment of the significance of Indigenous biodiversity values. I think that just needs to be a bit reworded and refined, so it's the purpose for doing an assessment of the Indigenous biodiversity values is not just around pets. Um, I think. Uh, Dr. Robinson acknowledged that, and that that would feed into a vegetation and fauna management plan, yeah, yes. and whether or not there needs to be a bit more specificity in here as to what yeah. is expected, what is the purpose, and what's expected of a vegetation and fauna management plan. Not sure. Thank you. Just any other questions? Nothing further? Oh, you do. Thank you. You're on. Okay. Mr. Lyle, just a couple from me. Um, I guess first one is page eight, policy RE 6.3 in the stormwater management plan. It's really following on from um, the chair's comment, but perhaps my comment might be that's requires a stormwater management plan to do a whole lot of stuff. I mean, you look at all those things and then you look, look back at the current stormwater management plan, there seems to be a disconnect. So I think it needs some further thought about, yeah, I guess it's outcome. So there's outcomes in the SMP here and I think there needs to be more alignment between, between the two. Yeah, I think the, the stormwater management plan that we've prepared for the plan change is to demonstrate feasibility right. of the zoning, and that yeah, it's, it's possible to design, yeah. possible to design to accommodate yeah. the effects, um, particularly in terms of stormwater, okay. for development of the zones that we've identified. Is it feasible? Yes, it's feasible. We think um, certainly 
um, more work to do, but it's feasible. Yeah. But and, I, and I guess is that that sort of the um, you know, the use of words. You know, what this is a stormwater management plan, and the next one's going to be stormwater management plans, yeah. or mm. what what we got to in um, some conferencing. Um, with the recent jury one I was involved in, that there would be another document that would be called maybe an implementation stormwater plan or something yeah. like that. So it's, yeah, otherwise it gets really confusing. Yeah, so the, um, what we've volunteered is the requirement to provide a stormwater management plan with the subdivision development application. And that would be um, one that probably um, continues to be upgraded um, along the way. Um, but it's a it's a whole catchment stormwater management plan that provides a lot more detail than what you have now because we're going to go through the full detail design process. Yeah. And then my other comment is on X X nine point seventeen, which I actually meant to ask one of your experts. I don't think Mr. Ferrance here still is he? No, he's, <laughs> no he's but it was. 17 talks about maximising the use of grey water and storm water. I'm not sure why that's why grey water is in because grey water typically is is uh, the water from the wastewater from the laundry. <coughs> but I think what's trying to say is to capture capture roof water and reuse that for non-potable. So perhaps I'll just follow up on that. I... Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, obviously, I've, I've, I've already made it quite clear that we're very happy to improve the, the principles. I think, mm. um, to to be clear, we actually think we're doing we're doing something that um, others haven't done in this plan change. Mm. You look back on the other plan changes that have. Mm. <coughs> Fraction of the information. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, the world's changed, as I've said earlier. That's fine, and, we're, and, and we'll do the work that's required. I think you know we're trying to communicate that we're volunteering best practice, yeah. um, and we have to demonstrate that in the consent process. It's a requirement. I mean. Um, there is still water sensitive design requirements in the land development manual already, which reference GDO4 and all sorts of other things, yeah. as Mark Foley has um, pointed out to you. But we're trying to be, um, we're trying to do better than that mm -hmm. by making it a making it a um, a better outcome for the site. Mm -hmm. yep. Well, I think on that note, I think I just need to reflect Commissioner Tepany's view that I mean we do think the intent is right. I can I we we can understand that's clearly the proposition that's been put to us, I uh, think all you're saying is, is how it gets wrapped up and delivered. And of course, as I said right at the outset, <coughs> you know, to all the parties that we would be discussing plan provisions on the basis that we need to understand how they would come out in the end. And of course, it's all subject to the plan sure. being approved. And if it is approved, then the provisions need to be right. So, um, and your evidence is very clear that you're happy to continue to work on them. So thank you for yeah. that. And if, and if, I mean, we have been through, what, three or four months of pretty intensive um, conferencing and yes. evidence and rebuttal <laughs> and everything else that goes with it. Yeah. <laughs> um, and that's put a hell of a lot of pressure on um, Gina and her team and, and ours. And in hindsight, if in the ideal world, if we had a, an extra week or two, we, we could have ironed a few of these things out. But it's been a pretty full on few months. Um, I don't, I don't want to take it that I'm trying to change the subject at all, but um, I, in front of me I've got the word Papakainga and um, I just wonder whether or not it's worth clarifying. There was a question about whether or not that was um, enabled. I have spoken to Nadi Kwata um, briefly about this and um, there was um, with to two of the Nadi Kwata members that were here um, yesterday and their feedback was Papakainga is actually something probably quite different nowadays than what it, what it was um, previously. Um, the definition in the Nelson um, Resource Management Plan is essentially, it's, it relates to multiple owned um, land, so community land, um, and that's certainly not um, out of the question for this site, um, but it would be what we refer to as comprehensive housing now, because comprehensive housing, I, I apply for comprehensive housing developments for the retirement, retirement villages, for example, and they don't own their own title, but they're living communally um, with one owner. 
or it can mean comprehensive housing where the iwi um, develop housing with their own titles which allow their, their um, whānau to, to buy their first homes. So um, the difference is really um, very little, very little in reality. Um, the planning framework would provide for that in a modern way. Thank you. Anything else for Mr Lyle at this point? No. Thank you Mr Lyle. Um, thank you Mr Marson. I, is, I think that's the case for the applicant at this stage. Um, thank you to you and thank you to your team um, for the last couple of days. So on that basis we will adjourn until 9.30 tomorrow morning um, and we'll start with um, the submitters um, and hopefully we'll have an updated schedule um, first thing in the morning. Thank you everybody. Um, oh, before sorry. we go, sorry. Chair, um, I was just hoping I could do some housekeeping oh, sure. with the panel yes. in right. terms of the council experts. Um, so my intent was for next Thursday, uh, the council has been assigned um, their slot. Um, I was wanting some direction from the panel in terms of who I may excuse from attending. Mm -hmm. um, it was my intent to have Miss Purton, Dr Blakely, um, Dr Fisher, Mr. Wilson, Dr. McEwen, Mr. Gervin, and Mr. Ridley here. So that covers stormwater, ecology, water quality, water sensitive design, heritage, landscape, and earthworks. Um, Mr. McIndoe, I'd agreed with him that he could come in by Zoom because I assume the panel may not have too many questions of Mr. McIndoe in terms of urban design. Um, and then there was Mr George Sin as well. And um, Mr George Sin can be available in person, um, but also in, by Zoom if necessary. So those who I really have question marks around were Mr Petherham um, in terms of recreation. Obviously he is here in Nelson, so it's very easy for him to come. Um, Mr Yarrell in terms of water supply, Mr Horry in terms of geotechnical and Mr Franklin in terms of wastewater. Thank you Vic. What I'd like to do, I'll just take a five minute adjournment, I'll discuss it with the panel rather than me just say who I think and the other panel yes, members certainly. say no, 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 we want them. Um, I think it'll be quite useful, so I, um, if, if you just give us five minutes um, and we'll come back. I mean, if anyone else wants to leave, that's fine, but if we just give us five minutes, we'll have a quick discussion and come back. Yes, and ju I'll just add, add. that um, I have instructed the experts that they are to ensure that they are listening in um, when their relevant expert for Save the Mai Tai and Friends of yeah. the Mai Tai right. okay, are you. also presenting. So the question really is, which of the council experts need to be here next Thursday? Can we yes. just take a break for five minutes and we'll Thank come you. back? Thank you.